Hello, my friends. Uh, happy 90s episode. Uh, we're back with the decade episodes. Uh, Carlos Blair and good friend Mike, who was in the comfort episode. So thank you for coming back, dude. I appreciate it. Um, couldn't think of a more fitting guest, honestly, for for the 90s. Are you a 90s baby, Mike, by the way? I am uh, 2000. Close. But... <laughs> we're close enough. Yeah, yeah. I think the rest of us are at least I think we were all born in the 90s, right? Yep. Well, at least yep. the latter half of the 90s. 95 uh, smack dab in the middle. Yeah. Hell yeah. I'm 97. Um I'm 1994. I'm the oldest one oh, here. Fuck shit. <laughs> um so I guess like before we do the list, like this is kind of like a special opportunity for this for this series. Like, do you guys remember like an early movie you saw or like an early like theatrical experience of living in the 90s because i was born in 97 so i i literally have zero like probably seen like cartoons at an early age but like do you guys have like a distinct memory from like 1990s cinema that still carries on i think i remember seeing toy story 2 in theaters well not i mean i remember is honestly i don't know i'm just i'm pretty sure <laughs> i've seen toy story 2 in theaters yeah, that's amazing about as, it's about as much as i know i think that's the Probably the earliest film I can remember that I saw in theaters was Toy Story 2, because after that, like my earliest memories of going to the theaters were like early 2000s movies like mm-hmm. yeah, same. Harry uh, Harry Potter and Shrek mm-hmm. and The Mummy Returns and Shrek. shit. <laughs> Mummy Returns, yeah. Yeah. Scorpion King, all that yeah. stuff. <laughs> uh, my earliest memory is probably actually Takashi Miike's audition. And then came out in 99. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My parents wanted to breed me to international cinema early on. So that was on all the time. Uh, no, but really, um, amazing decade. Uh, obviously, we don't have to keep saying that. Every decade's pretty damn stacked. But like, I know, I don't know, for you guys, like, this was the hardest list for me to make just because of the output of movies. Like, obviously, as time goes on, as like we get closer and closer to current times, I think we've all seen movies. I don't know. I, it might just be me, but like for me personally, I've seen movies more during current decades, like '90s and beyond. Um, yeah, me too. I don't know if it's the same for you guys. Like you could, you know, even check your letterbox and see which decade. But like '90s onward, I've just seen like just too yep. much shit to to even count. So yeah, I'm the exact same way. Same here. That's it. Yeah, is like my decade for um most the two thousands. Yeah, like two thousands, I'd say. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the case for sure. Um, and it was like incredibly difficult for me to craft this list just because of the fact that since I kind of have a lot of nostalgic value that's like incredibly personal to me when it comes to a lot of the nineties films, it was like really painful for me to be like, okay, let me try to remove some of that. Like, even though a lot of the films that I have that kind of value with are still really fantastic films, but I try to really do my best and be like, okay, let's, let me try to, let me try to evaluate how much like personal value I have with this film over like it's actual like greatness. And it was hard to kind of do that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, there's, it's impossible to like completely remove that. This list is probably compiled mm-hmm. of mostly films. That I still have like a lot of personal attachment to, but yeah, it was for that reason, it was probably one of the most difficult it's pro- I don't know if it was as hard as the night. I mean, uh, as hard as the seventies, mm. but it's it's probably at least the second most difficult list for me to craft so far. Totally, I feel like the seventies maybe had a more output of just pure, you know, masterpieces that were you know defined cinema. But for me, the nineties had more movies that I have like a personal sort of yep. connection to that kind of like makes me feel guilty leaving them off. Um, Same. But again, yeah, like you're right. Like none of this has been easy, but this is like, I would Mike and I and and Blair too were talking about like how even like even right before this, I've been wrestling with my choices. Like the second we hit record, I'm like shit. Um, <laughs> so it's not going to be easy, but we are on a time crunch, so we're going to just go ahead and start the list. Uh, just dive mm-hmm. right into it. Um, and as tradition, I'll let our guests go first. So, Mr. Mike, what's your number five film, please? My number five film is 1999's uh, Claire, Claire Denis' uh, Beau Travail, which um, 
So I do not have a lot of um, experience with Claire Denis uh, movies, but I am well aware of her place in like art house, art house cinema, the art house circle. I saw this movie. I rewatched it actually. Uh, I say like about a month ago by this point, and I I had seen it before, and I I did like it. I liked it very much. Um, this is a movie about um essentially in short, it's about like French uh foreign legion officers in the desert, and it's about it's like a uh day more like a day in the life story. Um, that um kind of Claire Denis uh. A direction in this movie is it kind of captures just the day-to-day mundane activities of these soldiers from like the female gaze perspective and in that regard she does an incredible job in this movie of capturing the like the texture the color and like the feeling of uh, being in the desert and um just like um uh, the just <laughs> the look of this movie is amazing and um it's so colorful but not much happens in this movie which is really what impacted me the most this is very much a case of a uh, visual storytelling in some regards this is um a-, a love story that it has been described as a love story because although it's not like uh, a- it doesn't directly tell you this is a movie about like gazes and like uh looks um it's kind of a celebration about like uh bodies the re- the removal of uh ego it's very very much a male centered uh, movie, but uh, uh, Denise's direction in this movie is really um, says a lot. With I'd say a little bit, because um, again, not very much dialogue, but um, the use of like color, uh, music, especially in this movie. Which if you've seen this movie, this movie has an incredible ending involving uh, music, and there's like uh, there's like club sequences throughout this movie that really. Um, add a lot of color to the movie. It's amazing. It's a very textured movie, very powerful movie without um, really saying a lot. And um, it really did blow me away. And um, I think is of like a lot of the art house movies I've seen from like the 1990s, this one really affected me the most and immersed me the most in its world. And um, it just really showed me how amazing uh, Denny is as a visual director and how much she can say with uh so with just the camera and i really loved it and i say it's my number five uh for this decade sweet man i i love that film as well um i claire denis was like i struggled with a lot of her films but like beach Bo was one that really broke boundaries i thought and like the way she kind of deconstructs masculinity and kind of like turns mat like mankind is sort of like this animalistic sort of very objective viewpoints on them and like it's really and like you said like the visuals in that movie are like absolutely stunning like there's shots that really stick with me um of them like them and the landscapes and everything so absolutely yeah, that, an amazing um, pick like one of the things i love about it so much it's such a this is such a like a primal movie um yeah. that, just very very visceral and um i've never really honestly seen anything like it and i, I highly recommend it if you haven't heard of this movie it is on the criterion collection so i'm sure it, it does have a following um in that circle like the letterbox circle but um if you're into movies that uh really just um just i don't know just capture the feeling of just being somewhere very foreign um just very, almost very exotic but it's super super visceral i'd, I'd highly suggest this movie me too. Yeah, Same dude. here. I'm I'm really excited that you talked about this film because I mean I don't know much about this movie besides like the bare minimum that is directed by Claire Denis. Um, mm-hmm. that it made it really high up on the sight and sounds poll. Um, and that yeah. just overall, like people really love it. Um, and besides the the uh cover, which is basically like the the shirtless guy, and I didn't know like anything about it at all, like I plot wise, like it's theme. It's style. I pretty much didn't know anything about it. So um, I think it's awesome that you were able to talk about it and like describe your feelings as to why you do enjoy that film so much. Cause now I'm like definitely a lot more excited to see it. Same here. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. You guys will love it. You guys will love it. I think it's uh, it's so it's like some of the best visual storytelling without explaining like that I've ever seen on film, honestly. It's a oh, difficult man. movie, honestly, to I think to put into words because, like, there on the surface, really, you could say not much happens in it, but there is so much happening in this movie that, what, like, when you experience it, um, it takes a little bit to kind of sink in, like the movie. Yeah. But if you really give it your attention, 
um, like Denise visual poetry is pretty unforgettable. And um, I think easily one of the standout um, moments in like art house cinema from the 1990s that I've personally seen and which is not a lot, but um, Mm -hmm. definitely a a movie that sticks with you, like, especially after the ending, which I will not spoil, but um, is one of the best of the 90s, I'd say. One of the best final shots, yeah, like Incredible. that I can think of for sure. Other quick Claire Denis recommendations for y'all, real quick, if you haven't seen them, is Trouble Every Day, which is sort of a cannibal horror movie with Vincent Gallo, um, and High Life, which came out semi recently, which is a very fascinating uh, sci-fi film with Robert Pattinson. So she yeah, always has, she, she has a really distinct style that I love. Yeah, that that's the only film I've seen from Claire Denis is High Life. I and I actually really enjoyed that one. So. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. It's a crazy one for sure. Um, and she's always pushing the boundaries. Like she made that movie Stars at Noon that was like really mixed a can a few years ago. And I've heard it's like just really crazy what it, what it does with like story construction and everything. So I'm always intrigued by her as a filmmaker. So I'm glad we could like spotlight her uh, in this list. And that's definitely her masterpiece. Definitely. So um, it's a great way to kick us off. Um, Blair, would you do you want to go next? Sure. All right, so my number five is a movie that it's my get a, might get a few mixed reactions in this uh, this podcast episode, but I genuinely feel it's great. So I'm gonna go with Cronenberg's Crash, 1996, I believe. Um, awesome. Yeah. So this is to me my favorite Cronenberg. I first watched it uh, last year, not. Not thinking it was going to be amazing. I was just kind of intrigued just knowing the plot synopsis. It's kind of uh, very interesting, to say the least. Um, I I gravitate more towards kind of like shocking movies. So that's kind of why it piqued my interest at first. But um, after watching it, like I fell in love with it. And to me, there's like a lot of like dark psychological like implications and substance, like substance wise to the movie. Like, um, to me, it kind of just like showcases this really dark, morbid fascination and curiosity that like kind of all people have within them. But these these uh, group of characters kind of just like exhibit that and um, get off to that, really. Like for th- for those who don't know, it's about like people who um, <laughs> fetishize car crashes and like anything to do with that and like have have sex on like car accident scenes and all this fucked up shit um there's not like a ton of body horror in the movie like it's very toned down when it comes to like uh his other movies like the fly and um uh video drum but like all the makeup effects and all the like shots of people with their scars and stuff genuinely made me feel like uneasy and like mm-hmm. uh queasy in a way that like I don't feel watching a lot of gore in movies like it's just uh it feels very heavy for some reason like yeah I, I can't really describe it um uh obviously it goes to say it's very very horny there's like so much scenes <laughs> where the um all the sex is just disgusting and like so deviant but you can help but like you you can't like look away from the screen. It's like so intriguing in a way. Um, and honestly, I really love like it's kind of color color palette, and it has a super unsat a desaturated like lo-fi look. Like I know its title sequence is kind of infamous for looking like shit, but I kind of huh. think that like kind of adds to it. I like that it that it looks that way because it just it's almost very off-putting because there's like no sound and uh kind of gets you into the tone for like what this movie is going to be um so yeah i i love this movie a lot i need to rewatch it because i bought the arrow 4k oh, just sick. A, just a month ago but yeah um if you haven't seen it i highly recommend it uh crash by cronenberg i love that film a lot and that's david cronenberg is one of my favorite directors period and i kind of Semi regret not bringing up Videodrome last week um, or last episode, um, but I, I, you're right. I know Crash is very mixed generally by 
the people we know, but also like yeah. in general. <laughs> yeah. um, so I just wanted to defend you real quick. And I, I think that movie is a masterpiece. Um, same, buddy. I, <laughs> same. Same. Yeah. I think I, I know. I, I don't know if you guys saw a similar like when Titan came out, I saw I felt like that was like our exactly. 21st century version of Crash. You know, like she was very much influenced by that. I know. I love that too. machinery <laughs> and sex sort of Venn diagram, you know, um, I love Titan to death. It's so me too. Much. Yeah, yeah. It's one of my favorite movies of the decade. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there. It reminded me of Crash. So I know Carlos <laughs> probably has a lot to say about Crash. So I'll let him, I'll let him go. <laughs> uh, Titan, pretty good. Crash. <laughs> I don't like that movie at all. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I watched it twice and I don't know. It just does nothing for me at all. Um, I mean, I'm glad that y'all get something out of it. And honestly, I like, I wish I found it as interesting as the way that you were describing it. Cause the way that you were describing it sounds like it'd be such a great movie, but like when I'm watching it, I just, I don't know. I just couldn't get into it. I found personally like the narrative to be kind of repetitive and then thematically speaking, it just felt one dimensional and, I just kind of wish it took like its concept and maybe explored something more profound with it. But instead, sure. I, I just personally, I just couldn't get as much out of it as y'all did. And I really wish that wasn't the case because like from the sound of it, like everybody in the discord, like fuck pretty much everybody in the discord loves that fucking movie. So I'm just kind of the odd one out on that one. Mm-hmm. Do you struggle with other Cronenbergs or is it really, does that one stick out? I mean, not really. I either, I mean, I haven't like seen a Cronenberg film, but I thought, oh, it's a fucking masterpiece. But for the most part, like I dig most of his stuff, like Naked Lunch. I love that film. The Fly, I absolutely love that film. Um, Videodrome, I'm not like that too huge on, but I do like the movie. Um, Like same with The Brood, I like the film. So, I mean, I mean, I like pretty much all of his stuff to a degree. It's just Crash was like the one where I'm like, I fucking don't like this movie at all. That was like really the only <laughs> one where I was like, I just don't like like flat out. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes people do not like like most Cronenberg's movie, but Crash is the one. That That's why like. I was surprised. Yeah, because yeah, people that love like erotic sort of thrillers and kind of fucked up romances love that movie. And like they don't fuck with the body horror stuff. So you know but i yeah. I, I, tell, I totally get what you're coming from because like that movie is like a lot of his movies kind of repeat the the world it's more about world building than i guess narrative in some ways so i get what you're saying but but mike yeah that's kind of true mike are you into that movie or cronenberg as, I, as a whole well i actually have not seen crash I, i've seen a couple cronenbergs i've seen like i saw the fly like almost like 15 years ago I uh, can't say too much uh, if I liked it or not, but um, I've seen History of Violence many times. It's actually one of my favorite movies. Um, Amazing film, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, but yeah, I haven't gotten around to Crash, but I, I do remember um, in the early 2000s seeing the poster for Crash for the first time um, in like a, I don't even know, it's like a landmark theater and being like, wow, that looks, that looks like something. I can't, <laughs> there's like two posters, I can't remember which one, but yeah. Um, Definitely, I haven't forgotten about the like seeing that poster, but um, I'll get around to it one day. But um, I do admire mm-hmm. Cronenberg uh, for his contributions to like body horror, like experimental. Yep. Style. I mean, he's a legend. So um, totally, he absolutely deserves his props for everything he's done. But um, mm-hmm. I haven't seen. Him yet. Gotcha. Well, Blair, all, all I'm gonna say is I, I love that pick, but I hope you have the same love for uh, Crimes of the Future in the future. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I do not. As the resident I, resident Cronenberg stand, all I'm going to say is in 10 years, I hope you're like, Jake, <laughs> I was wrong about that movie. Yeah, I did I, not with fuck it. with that movie. I that was boring. No, no, no. Just a, little, <laughs> just a little joke because I've, you know, I was the only buddy one in the discord defending that movie, I believe. Maybe someone else did. There, there's a there's a couple. Uh, other I felt now. I felt like on my own island. Yeah, for sure. I mean, shout out to Tommy in the Discord. Tommy is like a huge defender of uh <laughs> of that film. Like he he really loves it. So. I gotta talk to Tommy about it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I love that film too. I love Tommy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Tommy. Um, all right, uh, Carlos, you're next then. Awesome. All right, so my number five pick is a film that it's gonna surprise. A lot of people out there because it's so low but what's even more shocking is that it 
it at first it didn't even make the fucking list um and then just after thinking about it more i just realized like it just doesn't make sense for me not to include this on the list so <laughs> yeah. um my number five is stanley kubrick's eyes wide shut um yeah this film i mean this is stanley kubrick's last film and it's a doozy um it's such a bold piece of filmmaking. I mean, it's unfortunate that it is his last film because you can tell that even after his last film, he still had all that talent that he's had his entire career. It's just, it's on display with eyes wide shut. Um, I mean, obviously the direction is fantastic. Just the way that the camera moves throughout the film, it just feels so seamless and feels so like mysterious and suspenseful Stanley Kubrick is just to me a master of cinematic presentation. And again, with eyes wide shut, that's very clear. Um, but yeah, uh, this is a fucking wild movie. This is a wild ass film. <laughs> I mean, like everybody knows about the uh uh like ritual orgy type scene in the film, and it is that is just like one of the most like ominous and unsettling. And also beautifully captured scenes I've ever seen. Um, and again, it's bold as hell. I mean, that shit is really daring to make. I mean, it's I mean, it's showcasing, you know, a depiction of the elites in a way that is, you know, it's incredibly suspect. Um, mm -hmm. And and it's I don't know, it's just such a darkly bold film. And that the fact that he went that far um, with this film, because it's basically it's like half erotic thriller and like half conspiracy thriller um it meshes both of those genre type things together in a way that is so compelling and unsettling and um unlike anything that you'll ever see really and um the performances are fantastic i mean i'm not really the biggest tom cruise fan but i think he fucking kills it in this film he's really really great um nicole kidman obviously and they were I, I mean it's just awesome that tom cruise and kidman they were both like an actual married couple at the time when they made this film yep. um so them like making this film together i just think it's it's just something like special to behold on screen because you don't really get shit like that often um especially considering the context of like what they're arguing about when it comes to their like sexual frustrations when it comes to the restrictions of marriage stuff like that um just a really eye-opening and honest film when it comes to tackling these these types of subjects um of marriage and um even like rich culture and shit like that but but yeah um yeah this film is just it's really 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 fucking great it's um again it's 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 probably it could it could barely make probably my top five kubrick but it's not that's not to dog on eyes by shut at all. Cause it's still a fantastic film. It's just that Kubrick's made so many amazing pieces of art that it's, it's really hard to like craft a top 10 from his films, but yeah, eyes wide shut. Amazing, amazing film. Um, you know, if you haven't seen it yet and you've been kind of sleeping on it, please just whatever you have the time, just make it happen. Cause it's, it trust me, all of Kubrick's talents is all still there. And it's just something amazing to watch. It's, it's really something else. So that's why eyes wide shuts my number five. Love it. I felt yeah. uh, Eyes Wide Show was originally going to be on be on mine because uh, that is my favorite Kubrick for anybody who doesn't know. I love it so much. Oh, hell yeah. Wow. Blair, we continue to have the same taste because that is also my favorite Kubrick film. Based. Based. <laughs> I, I had it on my list, but I, I kind of was like seated it to Carlos because he's brought up Kubrick in every decade that <laughs> yeah. we've done so far. So it'd feel wrong if he didn't bring up eyes wide shut. So, and honestly, you're the biggest Kubrick fan. I like, I personally know, so I have to give it, but I totally agree. It's my favorite Kubrick. I just love everything. Everything you said, I totally agree with. Um, I also love the Christmas aesthetic too. I think it's like, Oh yeah. The way I he constructed that. like he constructed all those New York city streets and like all those apartment buildings by like hand. Um, and it's just it just looks so meticulous and, and just vibrant and gorgeous like and like you said nothing like it has been made even like in in terms of his filmography just such a unique piece as like his last film um, and fun fact uh, the, the piano player in that movie is Todd Field uh, who yeah. later directed Tar uh, who depicted uh, Nick Nightingale in that movie so 
yep. another great filmmaker involved with that with that movie. So, yeah, it's crazy because in uh in uh in this art theater near my house, well, not near my house, but it's in the same, it's in the city of my state. Um, it they were playing. There was a night where they were playing Eyes Wide Shut as like a throwback screening and then they they were playing uh tar in the same day like at the same time <laughs> nice. amazing yeah <laughs> yeah um and yeah like you said about tom Cru- i personally i love tom cruise as a performer not a person yeah to be clear um but that's <laughs> like it's crazy like in the late night like in the same year he worked with stanley kubrick and paul thomas anderson like he would never work with like two of the top auteurs at you know these days yep. so what a point in time for sure. And like lending his star power to like, to that film is, is really something um, just a, just an incredible movie. Like I, I, that's like kind of like the shining for me too, where every time I watch it, I like, I have a thousand new, you know, things I could like pick apart in it, you know, sort of analyze. Yep. There's just so much to it. Um, Absolutely. Mike, have you, are you an eyes wide shut fan? Have you been to the orgy? <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I love eyes wide shut. I haven't seen it in like two years. But um, like Carlos was saying, but it's such an ominous movie. Definitely one of the bravest movies I think Kubrick's ever. I mean, Kubrick ever uh, made, despite it being his last one. Um, it just more so. I mean, not gonna get too too into it. But um, if you know like the the theories about like um Kubrick uh, allegedly being killed because of this movie, um, it just it makes it uh even more ominous, I'd say. And um, but um definitely i mean one of his most unique movies um beautiful direction that again that one orgy scene is incredible so so beautiful with like the the little piano um going throughout the the background mm-hmm. um use of color um is immaculate um i i just i love it so much and uh also just taking into account like the the story um the all like the whole behind the scenes it just really um, I don't know, sticks on in Kubrick's filmography as just a really, uh, just a huge high point and um, very sad. Uh, his career was mm-hmm. cut short after that because, I mean, who knows what he would have had up his sleeve um, post uh, right. that shot. And um, definitely one of my favorite uh, cruise performances as well. Nicole Kidman, amazing as well. Love that Incredible. one. That one bedroom scene. Um, both yeah. Early on in the movies. Amazing. So, one of the best monologues, in my opinion. Absolutely. Oh yeah, she's like so high when she's doing it too. It's so <laughs> good. incredible acting. Yeah, yeah. We haven't even talked about just like the crazy conspiracy revolving around Kubrick's death surrounding this film as well. Right. It's just, just like, I mean, we we could talk for hours just about that too. Yeah. But um, but yeah, that's like another piece of lore that's surrounding this film that makes it just like a a monumental piece of of, of filmmaking when it comes to the the the, the uh history of film in general but yeah i i fucking love this movie a lot so i'm glad i decided to include it i thought i was out of my mind i was like what the fuck was i thinking this needs to be in my list <laughs> yes i would be so ashamed like if it didn't make the cut at all <laughs> yeah at least one of us would have said it you know i'm just i'm just glad that the kubrick stand could bring it up you know um which i want to ask like since his life was cut short carlos like mm-hmm. If he had one more film or maybe many more films, like what what kind of subject matter slash genre would be like your dream Kubrick movie, like post eyes wide shut? Like what would I know that's tough, but like I always think about that. Like what would you wanted him to do before he if he had like one more film in him? I mean, personally, this might be a little biased, but I would love to see him tackle just straight horror again. Yes. Um, like <laughs> yeah. you, another, I mean, whatever, I mean, really anything in the horror genre, but personally just like another psychological type horror film, I think he could absolutely kill or do it like a, like a, uh, like dystopian, you know, future kind of film, something like children of men esque, like, yeah, you know, Kubrick handling something like that, I think would be just absolutely amazing. So yeah, it, that's what kind of what artificial intelligence was gonna be in a way. Yeah. But that's true. Yeah, he, never... he he prepped that movie, so that would have been his next. He was gonna do more sci-fi. So yeah, that's a good point. Spielberg true. schmaltzed it all up. Yeah, I do not <laughs> like that movie. I'm sorry, it's not. It's too much schmaltz. Too much. I think it has a decent like. Well, I haven't seen it in such a long time, but I think I I, I remember it having like a decent like first act or so at least. And then it, I just feel like the movie just kind of gets worse as it goes along. 
Yeah, the first act in it in itself is really great. It, it literally could be like a great sh- uh, short film. Yep. A Kubrick homage, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I love the movie, but I, yeah, I totally get what you guys are saying. It's not... I kind of watched it before knowing that Stanley Kubrick prepped it, like when I was younger, so mm-hmm. I didn't have that sort of in my head, but it's definitely a, something to think about when you're analyzing that movie. Honestly, I, I need to watch it again. It's been like at least six or seven years since I've actually seen that movie from start to finish. Yeah, I'd love to know your take on it for sure, because it is such a Kubrick product. You know, it's very much his vision passed on to someone else, which is crazy. But but yeah, Eyes Wide Shut. Great movie. I'd Definitely a, an early contender for the top 10 of uh, the 90s for sure. Um well, okay, I'll go next. Um, my number five is a film by one of my favorite filmmakers, um, which honestly a lot of these are in the 90s. Um, I try to showcase one from like five of my favorite directors ever. So the first one is a Mike Lee film, and it's got to be Secrets and Lies. Uh, oh, hell yeah. Objectively speaking, I think his the greatest film he's ever directed. And man, I mean, this movie... I know, Mike, you're you're a huge all of you, I think, love this movie that have seen it. But I'm going to let you guys chime in as well. But like, I think for me is one of the best depictions of human relationships and family life ever put to screen. And that's something that Mike Lee has been such a such a just kind of like push the envelope in terms of, you know, depicting family life and sort of middle class lifestyle in Great Britain. And like this movie is like the ultimate slow burn family drama too because like it's all you can feel the tension just sort of rising and rising as this movie goes on um as more things are revealed that different relationships are sort of um pending and you just feel this just uneasy dread throughout this whole movie and not in like a very you know uncomfortable way it's just a very relatable way like that kind of feeling you have with your your own family or your own relationships and it feels so so true to life in the in that way, and like the writing in this movie is so pitch perfect and tight. Uh, Brenda Bleffen, who plays the mother in this movie of the long lost daughter, um, you can see her there in like one of the best shots, one of my favorite shots in cinema history. One of the greatest performances Mike Lee has ever gotten, if not the best, next to like David Shulis and in, in Naked. Um, but man, the way this movie unravels is just so masterful. The the, the dialogue is just so pitch perfect and so collaborative because like Mike Lee works so tight and well with his actors, which is something I really appreciate. Um, and the ending is such an emotional, just gut punch, but also so cathartic at the same time. It's just, this movie makes you feel just so many facets of emotions. And that's what Mike Lee always intended to do with just simple conversation and human interaction. I think it's just masterful um, and rightfully um, won the Palm door, I believe uh, when it came out. Hell yeah. <clears throat> Yo, um, which, Cam too, Brenda Blethyn. Brenda, Ble- Brenda Blethyn, yeah, also very well deserved. So, um, as well, if I, I'm no disrespect to Francis McDormand and Fargo, but Blethyn's performances that's yeah. a tight wow, that's a crazy tight race. Those are two of my favorite performances on film, right there. Um, damn, but yeah, wow. holy, yeah, <laughs> brutal. Uh, honestly, yeah, that's that's crazy, but um. But yeah, just a film I love. I just adore Mike Lee so much. And not my personal favorite Mike Lee films are might be elsewhere. But if I were to say the best and the one that made me fall in love with Mike Lee even further was definitely Secrets and Lies. So I'll definitely let you guys chime in because I love that film so much. Yeah, dude. Uh, obviously, I got to shout out Mike here, too, because he's the one that brought this film to my attention um, during one of the halls. And Jen actually blind bought this film based on Mike's recommendation. Yep. And, oh, wow. And yeah. we watched it and fuck, I was blown away by this film. I didn't even like expect to watch a masterpiece, but that's exactly what I got. Um, yeah, this film is to me. This, I, I mean, obviously, the t- I think this film is fucking perfect. Um, it's, I mean, beautifully written from start to finish. It incorporates humor so well it incorporates dark drama incredibly well um and it's just beautifully encapsulated by amazing performances uh obviously like we already talked about uh Brenda Blethyn she is so amazing in this film I mean it's kind of mind-blowing how great she is in this movie 
Yeah. Um, she's just she just comes off so fucking like authentic, and she just I don't know she just does a wonderful job embodying that character. Um, and yeah, just like like you said, like when it comes to like the thematic notions of um like a dysfunctional family, and again like holding in things about each other for the sake of peace and not being truthful about certain things and everybody kind of having sometimes secret drama with each other, but sometimes open drama with each other. And it's just like this constant, like clusterfuck of (laughs) drama between each other that, you know, is to me like beautifully kind of explodes in the, in the third act as we see. Um, but like the explosion of emotions that we get in the third act of this movie is just fucking amazing. Like I just, yeah, I was just in awe of everything that I was seeing. I was like, wow, this is beautifully, beautifully acted, beautifully written, beautifully directed. Like everything about this is just so impactful and compelling. So yeah, this movie is this, I I love secrets and lies. That was actually my number five. And then I just thought about it for such a long time and I had to give the edge to eyes wide shut. But I mean, that's how much I love this movie. I think it's, I think it's absolutely fantastic in every way. Yeah. I haven't seen the movie in a while, but um, just, I remember being so like affected uh, by this movie. So I like themes of uh, family uh, secrets. Um, I mean, especially like the core story about like uh, finding your long lost mother. I mean, I, I, I it's not something I personally relate to, but the way uh, Lee, um handle the subject was with just so much care and just like humanity and i think the cast especially brenda blethin i mean is phenomenal in this movie but the whole cast in general the whole ensemble just does a phenomenal job of um just bringing all these themes to life um the, the whole third act is incredible but actually i love um that one scene like the barbecue scene um yes. I, I don't think yep. this movie gets enough credit for how good um how much uh like it blurs the line between like uh just like written and like improv yeah uh, mm-hmm. my knowledge the whole scene was that whole like barbecue scene is improv and the cast right. is like, flawless. it's just so organic and uh so beautiful um and I, there's not a weak link in a weak link in this cast um yep just a uh, really an um, incredible uh just piece of cinema just piece of uh drama just what uh, just anything it's it's honestly like a timeless movie and how well these uh, themes are um, explored um, just uh, so realistically, just so organically. It's a beautiful movie. I, again, I haven't seen it in a while, but um, pretty unforgettable stuff. Uh, so totally one of my favorite Lees. I, I would not argue if you said it's like his greatest achievement because I pretty much think, I do think it is, like objectively speaking, like the greatest thing. Yeah. He's seen. I've seen quite a few. Yeah, I, I cannot wait to to watch the film again. I only watched it once and I am just so excited to to watch it again whenever that day comes. Yeah, it's yeah, because it's like so the first time it's so I've seen it like two or three times. It's so emotionally just taxing. And when you get to rewatch it, it's like you kind of analyze his camera movements, which is so which are so precise, especially in that diner scene. Um, and it, that whenever they're sitting and stuff and there's so much artistry put into this movie like he he really came into his own as like fully understanding like the art of cinema but also like his own style so i just love it for that and like i would agree mike like i think it's his greatest achievement as a director for sure so that's why i had to be there it had to be in the top five for sure um uh yeah mike do you want to i think your number five is next your number four sorry is next four my number four is the Abbas Kiarostami movie from uh, 1997, Taste of Cherry. Now, this is a movie that is pretty popular, I've seen, in, like, the letterbox circle, the criterion circles, you know. I mean, I think most of us have seen this movie, to my knowledge. But um, I saw I saw it a couple years ago, kind of when I was getting, um, getting going with my journey with, like, uh, Art House Cinema, delving more. And I really was blown away. Um, by this movie's uh, minimal, uh, minimal structure, how it is essentially just three uh, big conversations revolving around uh, mortality, uh, suicide, um, religion, um, just many topics. But um, it, it's a movie that I, I think handles these uh, subjects so um, so carefully. It does not go over the top whatsoever. Um, the conversations are just uh, go go flow very organically. 
Um, there's not a lot of flash to it. It, it really is just uh, three big conversations and this man driving around uh, Tehran. Um, and you you very much get the sense this man um, is at a point in his life where he's just given up and um, he just doesn't have uh, anything to look forward to. But um, these conversations just explore the, the counter to that, like how um, precious life is, like what like there is to look forward to. And I think in that regard, this movie does such a good job of uh, conveying these themes through just really just dialogue and very, very minimal direction. It's such a minimal movie. And it, like kind of like with uh, Botravai, it, it just says so much with, I wouldn't say so little, but just again, very, very minimal. And it is so powerful in that sense. It, my favorite conversation in this movie is um, definitely the third one with uh, the the taxidermist, the, the professor. Yeah. Um, I think if you've seen the movie, you definitely know what I'm talking about. The monologue revolving around um, uh, mulberries uh, is honestly one of my favorite monologues, I think, just in movies. Um, just incredibly moving stuff. Very, very uh, poetic. Um but overall, just a really amazing movie. And one, I, one I've seen many times, actually. This is actually a, thing, a movie I do uh, see myself just coming back to quite often. I just saw it in the theater like about a week ago and just having, just sitting right there and just immersing myself in the world of this movie really, really, I don't know, drove home all its themes probably the most um, in regards to how many times I've seen this movie. It really just never fails to, to move me to really make me reflect on a, a lot of uh, issues in my own life at the world at large. It's an amazing movie from a filmmaker. I mean, really, really changed the game in the art house cinema and like the art house circuit. Um, I haven't seen every Kiarostami movie. I've seen this one, uh, Taste of Cherry, a uh, certified copy, Where's the Friend's House. Uh, he has a very, very sizable filmography, but uh, one that hopefully over the course of my life, I'll, be able to explore more because Kiristami's style, just very, very, very minimal style, just kind of uh, examining the the experiences of day to day people with really just just words. This conversation is just so compelling to me, and um, yeah. But this is easily my favorite of the ones I've seen, and I, I think I can just leave it at that. Just Taste of Cherry is just a really just incredible experience and if you haven't seen it i would highly suggest it so that is my number four sweet very well said uh mm-hmm. very well put i will save my thoughts because spoiler alert that's gonna be on my list later on so i will i will oh shit i will seed my thoughts to carlos and blair on that one well it was originally on my list as well, but I took it off after hearing uh, Mike mention that, and it's okay. We got a backup. We're all good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, Taste of Cherry is, to in my in my book, like really up there with one of the best of the decade. This movie is incredible, and the way it tackles its heavy theme is like, to me, it really doesn't get any much better than that. Like Karastami fucking mastered tackling such a heavy subject like suicide and um doing it in a way that's like not ham-fisted with like a preachy me- preachy message but it's just done so naturalistic in these sequences of conversations that the ca- main character has and how that kind of changes his um you know uh his perspective on what uh, he's going to do in his life and i and i love how you don't know what drove him to these set of circumstances, but um, you're just kind of seeing the aftermath. It's uh, it, it kind of feels more universal that way, but also more natural. It's just, yeah, Kiristami, it's his magnum opus, in my opinion. Totally. Damn. Car- I, Carlos. I, I really like the film. Um, I pretty much agree with, with what everybody's saying. I think... I mean, if not anything, I mean, Taste of Cherry proves again just how incredibly intelligent Kiristami is as a writer and just as a filmmaker, but definitely like as a writer, just his ability to write out these incredibly like philosophical and thought provoking conversations in a way that actually feels natural to the characters, I think is like a huge showcase of his talent because a lot of times when we watch movies, we hear characters you know having these long type of 
philosophical type of conversations, but sometimes it just comes off like as the mouthpiece of the filmmaker just coming straight to the character and it doesn't feel very natural. But with every Kiarostami film that I've seen, that is not the case at all. He is he somehow does a beautiful job at incorporating all this intelligent dialogue in a way that actually feels authentic. And I think that's, to me, that is like probably like the strongest thing about the film. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I like it a lot. It's not in my, it's not my favorite Kiarostami or anything. Cause I will, I would put, I would put a decent above that, like certified copy and close up and even whereas a friend's house, I'd put that above it. But then again, it hasn't been, I mean, it's been like what feels like at least three years now since I've seen it. So it is a film that I would like to watch again sometime soon. Cause I do remember it still being really good. Absolutely. I feel like we might talk about other Kurostamis later too, because he's mm-hmm. so many great films for sure. But but yeah, that's a great pick, Mike. Um like I said, I'll talk more about it when I bring it up myself, but love that film. But all right, Blair, what's your uh, what's your number four? So this one's actually gonna be the one I just choose to back up with after Taste of Cherry. I was battling between a different Kiristami film. Um, but I'm actually going to go with uh, Three Colors Red from Krzysztof Kieslowski. Awesome. Um, this is definitely one of my new favorite, like one of my favorite new watches um, that I've done quite a while. Um, it's it's kind of hard to explain what exactly about this film is so fucking works so well. All I can say is that the main actress of this film um Irene Jacob, Jacob, and the actor, oh, I, I forget his name. He's the guy from Amor, and um, right. And uh, we're talking about it's like something. something. Yep. Yeah, that guy. They're they're definitely the central focus of the movie, and um, it's kind of like to to me, the movie is kind of like about their dynamic and how they're so far away from each other in in terms of like their kind of like lifestyle and even like different states of mind and how they just kind of bounce back forth be- between each other um in their conversation and um the other thing is like the visual presentation is is so beautiful to me this is this is probably one of the uh, most beautiful looking movies i've ever seen obviously it has a very uh very deep like red thematic color like the rest of the three colors trilogy does um and yeah, to me, it's definitely the the best of the three. It's uh, there is a narrative to the film, but it's like not it's not necessarily the focal point. It's really just about the visual presentation and the characters. And um, it also kind of tie. It's the last of the trilogy, so the way it ties back into the other two films is um, I guess I would say like the most satisfying. It's the most like emotionally, um, yeah, satisfying one. Uh, yeah, I I highly recommend anybody who's seen any of the Three Colors films to check out this one because, uh, yeah, it's it's fucking great. It's, it's definitely one of my favorite films of the '90s. So, yeah, I'll leave it there. Amazing. That's that's also my favorite of the trilogy. Um, everything you said is just so spot on. Like, it's really about their dynamic. Um, just incredible performances and like, I love the elements of like voyeurism in the movie, especially in the first act. Um, oh, yeah. some, something Kislowski was always really kind of enamored with this, you know, kind of like the the male gaze, but also the female gaze in the case of Three Colors Red. Um, and gosh, like just the color scheme of this movie and, and just the technical aspects of it all blended with the emotionality of the characters is just so perfectly balanced to me. It's like, yeah, I, I agree. One of the best of the decade, one of the best caps like to, for me if like of any trilogy probably the best final film in any trilogy i could think of um just so perfectly caps it yes 1000 percent agree and like i said it's so beautiful like if you just look at any shot of this film like that that to me is kind of what just like i need to watch this movie because it just it, it looks so visually stunning yes was that his final film before he passed was there anything else i forget if there was I think it is movies. actually. Um, hang might on, have to, might have to fact check that. But shout out to Carlos for drinking whiskey. I didn't even notice till now. 
The US. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> For the 90s. Oh, yeah. Have you guys I, seen them? Mike, I know you said you haven't seen it, but Carlos, have you, have you dipped I, your red in the red yet? No, I've only dipped my toes into uh, blue. In the blue. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen any other ones besides uh, Three Colors Blue, which I really enjoyed a lot. Uh, yeah. It's got my favorite actress in the world julie Binoche in it and oh, yeah. uh, and um she's fantastic in it and the, that movie itself is thematically dense and really compelling and I, I i really enjoyed it um i just haven't got around to seeing the rest i mean i own the box set but i <laughs> haven't seen any of it like i've seen um i honestly i like three colors white doesn't have like the most resounding review so i've been like <laughs> yeah i've been yeah. really compelled to i'd really just want to skip white and watch red but everybody says no watch white because it makes three colors red more compelling so it really does like it my, does my my roadblock here is just kind of like <laughs> i mean just not wanting to watch white so if i can't if i'm not wanting to watch white then i feel like i'm never going to get to red so <laughs> i don't know about about blair i don't know about you but like i think white's definitely a good film though i think it's worth watching i don't think it's bad it's kind of straight down the middle for me I don't think it's bad, but I, I'm not even going to lie. And I'm sorry, Carlos, this is not going to help your case, but I thought it was pretty boring. I was I was not into the main characters, uh, but it's fine. I mean, it's good to just watch once and never watch again and just definitely worth it for Red. It's, it's definitely worth it because Red is like such a moving film. It's really beautiful thematically and like I said, visually. So, yeah, yeah. it's where it's definitely worth it to get to that point, because like when Red r- wraps up and everything comes together, you're like, holy shit. Yeah, and it, it really helps. Goosebumps. Yeah, it does. And if seen white would definitely help. So I recommend it. How long it, is Three Three Colors White? Is it like an hour and a half? It's not over two hours, is it? I don't think it's that long. So uh, three and a half hours? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's the length of Barry Lyndon. <laughs> it's the human condition part one. <laughs> it's uh, 92 quick. minutes. So okay. Oh, that's, that's an hour 30. Yeah. yeah. The longest one is red, which is 100 minutes. They're all like relatively pretty short, so. By the way, Carlos, I know you weren't huge on Double Life of Veronique, which I do mm-hmm. love too. But this Three Colors Red is so different. It's mm-hmm. it feels it feels practically nothing like uh, Veronique, and just more like a yeah, kind of in the same vein as the, the Colors trilogy. So I have Absolutely. no doubt, I really like it. You will, yeah. It's, I've never met awesome. a person that doesn't love Red, so <laughs> I'd be shocked. Yeah, I mean, from what I hear, that's most people's favorite out of the three. Yeah. So. I'm I'm definitely looking forward to it. I just I just gotta finally sit down and watch Three Colors White and just get over it. <laughs> <laughs> watch it on mute, you know. It's like it's all good. <laughs> on <a> two times speed <laughs> on your phone while you watch it and like played Subway Surfers or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, speaking of you, Carlos, what's your number? Uh, what's your number four? All right, dope. Um, so this is a film that I actually. I'm probably not gonna spend. We're probably, probably won't spend that much time talking about because I did bring it up in the uh, um, comfort films episode, um, but I couldn't help it. Like it is again one of those things where it just felt wrong not putting it into my top five of the '90s because I just love it dearly. Um, and that is the Big Lebowski. Um, yep. Again, uh, I kind of already went on about this film, but this is just like the apex of comedy. This is just. Cohen, I mean, this is actually my favorite Cohen Brothers film. Like, in terms of like a personal favorite, this is my favorite. Um, just a film that somehow magically just gets better and better on 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 a rewatch. And with comedies, you wouldn't think that would be the case because like a comedy, you know, you kind of you feel like you know all the jokes. So even if you watch it a second time, you're still gonna laugh at it, but you're not gonna feel like you get anything new out of it. It's just there to enjoy it. But for some reason, like with a Big Lebowski, it somehow gets funnier every time and you also feel like you're getting something new out of it every single time and it's just like such a blast to watch and it's a great like conspiracy film too like it's just kind of like poking fun at like conspiracy films and also like at like the uh um neo-noir genre too when you think about it um just kind of how you have a character that just kind of gets into one rabbit hole after another after another and after another and it resembles a lot of what you would see like in a neo-noir type of film, except this is more of like a goofball version of that. Um, 
but yeah, again, I, I don't want to go on too long because I did talk about it a lot already, but everybody's great in this. Um, Jeff Bridges as the dude, iconic. Um, I mean, Je- yeah, Jeff Bridges as the dude. Yeah, he's fucking really great. And then you have um, John Goodman as Walter Sobchak, which I, I don't know. I think he might be my favorite character in the movie. He's, he's just so best, yeah. He's just so good. Uh, everything, every time he's on screen, I'm literally like dying of laughter. He's just so fucking good in the movie. Um, is this your homework, Larry? <laughs> it's your homework, Larry. <laughs> you know, and the fucking money. And we know that this is your homework. <laughs> um, yeah, so I love that scene, by the way. That's like one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> it's in the incredible. Movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Damn, kid, fucking stonewalling me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, it's just, God damn it. I swear to God, that movie, this movie is just perfect. It's a perfect comedy. And it's a movie that when I watched it the first time, I didn't love it that much. Like, I liked it. I thought it was, you know, kind of like just a fun, silly movie. But, like, I wasn't that in love with it. But, like, the more I thought about it, I'm like, I kind of want to watch that again. So I watched it again. I'm like, okay, this is fucking really funny. And then I just found every single time I'm watching it, I'm like, yeah. okay, this might, this might actually be one of my favorite movies of all time. <laughs> um, it, so, yeah. It ages just like the finest wine possible because like whenever the first time i saw it it was the same way i was like that was good not but like not in love with it and then over time it just became like a top 20 favorite film of all time for me and something i watch like twice a year and like can quote front to back and like yep i don't think we mentioned this in the comfort movie episodes but like some of the cinematography by roger deakins in this movie is some of my favorite things he's ever done just because it's so unique to the to this film and like just images that really are just you that are like burned in my brain like even like the bubs the, the the dance sequence like the musical sequence with in the bowling alley just such gorgeous yeah. filmmaking like yeah. on, on, on its level while being so hysterical um just like god like every beat of this movie i just i love to death dude even like the subtle humor that's not meant for laugh out loud shit makes me laugh yeah. out loud <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> just like the like body movements and stuff like that yeah yeah we were talking about that too yeah with philip seymour hoffman walking down the hallway and (laughs) yeah it's too perfect um like when they go to the um when they go to uh walter's landlord's like uh uh like he's like doing some sort of like rehearsal performance or something yeah and he goes just like them sitting there watching that i don't know it just like it's not meant for a big laugh but it just makes me fucking laugh a lot he lives by the in and out burger yeah that- yeah <laughs> now, good burgers walter <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the cohen brothers like i'll talk about them later again but like they're my probably my favorite filmmakers of all time and that i, I thank that is- god every day that they made that film <laughs> like honestly yeah I'm so glad it exists. And it's like the ultimate comfort movie too, like that you brought up last time. Just yeah, hundred yeah. percent. You can pop this in anytime, any place. And it's just going to be amazing. <laughs> Hard for me not to say it should be in the top 10 of the nineties. I'll say that like, I can't. hell yeah. In my heart, it's like hard to say no, but it was originally going to make my top five, but I knew me I mean, too. Yeah. Was the episode, I was like, I'll just put it to the side. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, but I guess I don't love it as much as um, everybody else here. Got to keep watching. It. <laughs> and I've seen it like three times, three or four. But I can attest, like first time I watched it, I was like, "Yeah, I was fine." But it, it gets funny. Exactly. Time. Maybe the tenth time is when it becomes like a <laughs> transcendent masterpiece. <laughs> literally, like I think I've seen it like twenty times, and yeah. like it's literally gotten better each time. Like the last time I watched it, I'm like, "Is this the greatest film?" Is this yeah. the sight and sounds number one? <laughs> Usually, but, I would take that as a joke, like, "Oh, you gotta watch it ten times to like it." I mean, to to to, to fall in love with it, but it's just with the Big Lebowski. I feel like it's a little bit true. Like, no, honestly, <laughs> yeah, I'm not not even. It sounds crazy, but movies in the National Library of Congress. That's how good it is. <laughs> <laughs> there's a holiday. There's a cult Lebowski <laughs> fest now. It's like, yep. God oh damn. God. It's like a perfect pick for like uh, I mean the night like the like a nineties list. I mean just I mean obviously it's an, an amazing comedy, but like got to think about like how much like this movie influenced like it, it's like called mm-hmm. like called following like it, the, the literally the religion um, it inspired. I mean <laughs> it's the National Library of Congress it's endless list. It's uh, it's just such a cultural phenomenon. Like how could you not have it on like your top like top of the decade list? It's 
really one of the quintessential comedies. Pro- probably just ever made. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Amazing pick. It's crazy Thank how you. it bombed so bad. It bombed oh, yeah. so badly at the box office, you know, oh. at the time. Um, which make honestly makes total sense because yeah. like even us who think it's like the greatest thing ever, we're like first time I was like, I liked it, but not great. Imagine someone else is like that was the biggest piece of shit. Like after <laughs> watching Fargo and like everything else they've done. It's like Yeah, I guess see it, that. If you contextualize it now, it's like that's like such a power move on their on their yeah. part to make a movie like that. So it was one of those movies where they were probably like, all right, this is just going to be one for us. Like, yeah, you know, like yeah. there's something that we know is hilarious. They might not get it, but I just <laughs> we we have to make this. So they just made it truly um, making a movie for themselves, which I respect. <laughs> yeah, I was just along for the ride. At least like it, it gained so much traction, like as the years went along. I'm I'm really happy about that. Me too. Me too. Well, Blair, quick question. Where would you rank the Big Lebowski amongst the Coen Brothers films? Um, Roughly. Give, give me one second. I'm going to look up what else because I don't want to. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, they have a okay. lot of movies. <laughs> so honestly, I would put it as number three because No Country oh, for Old Men is my first. Fargo is my second. And yeah, Big Lebowski would be my third. Oh, OK. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm definitely not a hater, but I just uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to watch it again. Have you seen a, most of their films? Are you? No, wow. um, I dude, I love the Coens. They're I think they're one of the great, some of the greatest filmmakers out there. Um, but I have never seen like Serious Man, Raising Arizona, oh. Barton Fink, oh. Miller's Crossing. Love all like those. That. Love yeah. all of them. You'll love them too, honestly. Like I, the, their seen... output is insane. I've seen so much Coen Brothers, but the two that I haven't seen that like I really, really need to see is Raising Arizona and A Serious Man. Oh my God. You need I haven't seen those. A Serious Man is one of the most underrated movies of the past 20 years, in my opinion. Is it like, one of your uh, all-time favorites, uh, Jake? I, I, I remember Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fantastic. It's... I've only seen it once, but like uh I, I didn't even know what to, really what to say after it. I was kind of <laughs> speechless but um it's more perplexing than lebowski like times five like it's really it really challenges you but god it's i've gotten so much out of watching it over and over again it's impeccably made like every facet of it it's like yeah it as much like up me personally i can really grasp everything on the first try i mean no me neither no god it's crazy um i also took a coen brothers class in college so i i was able to analyze that movie like like pick it apart to death and i just fell in love with it i also wrote a pop- paper on lebowski about nihilism so that was great um i wish i could share it with you guys somehow <laughs> nice. um but yeah i i couldn't say enough about the cohen's um and yeah i'm so happy i'm happy you picked that because like that was that's in my heart that's my number like two one or two <laughs> of the decade like for Hell real yeah. for real so okay um Definitely going to switch the mood up here. But uh, my number four <laughs> um, is probably the most controversial film that's going to be on my top five, just in terms of the reception of it. But fuck it. I love it. Um, but uh, it is Twin Peaks Firewalk with me. Yes. A film correlated with the Twin Peaks TV show. Um, I won't say too much about this, too, because I've, I've talked about this on the podcast plenty of times. Um, I think I talked about it on the soundtracks episode and the... I think we did a sound design episode a while ago, but I think this movie is just not only such one of David Lynch's most experimental and and daring films he's ever made, but just really one of the most thought provoking films on trauma and sort of PTSD that I've I've ever seen put to film told in a metaphorical, you know, David Lynch fashion, obviously. Um, and I don't want to connect it to the show as much because like, I, I honestly think it exists separately from the show really well. Um, obviously, you have to see the show to really grasp this film, but I think it explores things that are really set aside from the original show and more akin to, I guess, the Twin Peaks, The Return, which I also love. Um, but I think Cheryl Lee as Laura Palmer in this movie gives one of the best performances I've ever seen in a David Lynch film, uh, in my opinion. I think the sound design, like I said, like, is just designed just to kind of make you feel like her psyche and her anxiety and her dread. Um, And it's such an upsetting watch, like every aspect of it and kind of how it unravels is so upsetting, but it's a movie that really made me fall in love with Lynch even more. Cause like, it's such a daring 
take on the subject matter and uh, a really popular TV show to make something this abstract and crazy. Um, and I know it doesn't resonate with everyone else as much, but like to me, it's it's one of the quintessential David Lynch films and it's got a killer soundtrack. It's got an amazing, like you guys were talking about with Blue Velvet last week, just the amazing middle America Americana feel to it that I just adore. And um, this is, to me, it opened the doors for Lynch to make even crazier things like Mulholland Drive and like uh, um, Inland Empire and stuff like that, that are more abstract pieces of filmmaking. And um, and yeah, just such a daring thing to do based off the popular show. And I think is one of the most important films for his career as one of my favorite filmmakers ever. So uh, yeah, Fire Walk With Me. Um, I heard one of you guys say hell yeah so <laughs> that, that was me um, i um, i adore uh firework with me and you know what I, I think i'm actually watching it tonight actually oh really because what's, um what's the occasion yeah there i believe there's a movie night tonight in the misfit pond server so i'll finally be able to uh revisit it i've seen it twice and uh dude it's uh it's it's easily david lynch's darkest film and it has both uh one of the best performances i've like ever seen uh with cheryl lee Cheryl Lee, yeah. laura palmer she's incredible in the movie and it also has one of my favorite scenes slash slash sequences in any movie where oh, they're yeah. they're at this like uh club basically and there's yeah. so much great visual like um storytelling with this uh great fucking soundtrack in the background yeah. with laura palmer that's chef's kiss one of my favorite scenes ever it's ins- it's so great i'm glad you mentioned that because that's the scene that always like i always sticks with me from that film and like it's like 10 minutes long and you can't hear any of the dialogue it's just so striking yeah it's um definitely one of my favorites yeah gosh um mike have you i know i remember you talking about this movie briefly i don't know if you've seen it or not uh um i've seen i've seen all of uh twin peaks uh the original series um but uh, I've never seen this movie in uh, full, so I can't really comment too much. Um, I, I do have mixed feelings on Twin Peaks as a series. I over, yeah. I do enjoy it overall, um, especially season one and uh, I'd say the finale. But um, I have not seen Fire Walk with me. But the way the way Blair, I mean, described that one sequence just alone, I mean, does really uh, make me want to give it a chance because I did actually um, try to watch it at one point. Like I think it was like like right after I finished the. Uh, the series and i wasn't vibing with it all that much but uh again i'm, I'm more than willing to give it another try but i would just mm. give twin peaks in general another go um to just i mean get the full experience but no i have not seen it okay. the thing the thing about fire walk with me that people that i think people don't like is like the first 30 minutes are so weird and they're so, so bizarre it's, it's yeah. so disconnected from the rest of the film but if you like even if you don't like those 30 minutes like it's so worth it to stick it out before stick you it out get to, before you get to like the the main meat of the movie with laura palmer it's so worth it i love how effect bowie. sorry mike sorry go ahead all right i just want to say all right do you remember like bowie being in like the first like couple minutes yep. yeah <laughs> i was like what, what is going on here well, like, <laughs> it is so bizarre yeah yeah it, I, I love that experimentation at the beginning, though, because it kind of tests. He kind of likes to not troll the audience, but sort of like subvert your expectations in certain aspects. But then it makes like Laura Palmer's introduction and that whole sequence is so more so much more effective, in my opinion. Um, it sets the table of like the, the themes of the movie and everything. I know it's like really weird, though, like it's not traditionally like the best intro to a film ever, but seen it multiple times i've come to appreciate what he was doing at least um and and kind of appreciate the entire film as a whole so yeah i love it what it, it's if i were to my david rich late david david lynch ranking <laughs> david rich waking rich <laughs> what it, that's kind of a tongue david, twister david monkey rich <laughs> <laughs> uh it sits at number two it's my second favorite uh david lynch film i love it that much um, so yeah, that's my number four. Um, Mike, you're number three. Um, uh, my number three, hold on, I just have my list somewhere. Um, my number three is uh Buffalo 66 by directed by uh Vincent Gallo. Hell yeah. 
So this is um, one of the two Vincent Gallo movies I've just seen in general. I know he has a, a lot of um, star starring roles, and I know this is just one of the two movies he's directed. Uh, but between the two of them, this is by far the other one being Brown Bunny. <laughs> this is by far the <laughs> way. I mean, I mean the best thing I've ever seen him seen him in. Um, one of my favorite movies of the '90s for a lot of reasons, and one of my favorite romantic comedies. In general, this is a movie which I really um, haven't seen, like, directing, editing, um, just acting, like, this unique. And um, I would say it's, like, super, super experimental or, like, just out there. But it's such, it's such a, like, a singular experience that I feel like kind of only come from, like, the weirdness of uh, Gallo. Um, just, like, just right down to, like, the film stock uh, this movie used, which um, I'm not going to get super into it which uh, was apparently used for like filming like a uh, 1960s football games and football is like um, yeah. a, a central, like a uh, theme of the movie. If you, if you've seen it, but uh, overall, this is such like a beautiful experience very, very unique, very singular, very, very hilarious. And um, just um, a movie that I, I just, I really does make me wish Gallo tried more because um, his performance in this movie, um, it, it's kind of it's kind of typical Gallo, but I love the way um, his character evolves with uh, Christina Ricci, who's um, the the young girl. Like he uh, takes along with him. Because if you haven't seen, if you have not seen the movie, it is about a man who is released from jail, and um, he's he's basically he's basically has nothing anymore, and the the crime he committed is explored later on. Um, but he's essentially a loser who needs to, who still uh, somewhat cares about like impressing his parents. So he takes this young girl just off the street and, um, kind of, kind of rolls with him to uh, pose as his like a uh, fiance or a uh, wife. And, um, the whole experience is just, it's, it's kind of a movie that like it deals with like themes of like, um, um, I've heard like Stockholm syndrome in like a way and like the way the romance is explored but it's not it's not like weird it, it's genuinely this movie is so unique because it, it has like such a good heart it's very yeah. wholesome especially towards the end which takes me by take always takes me by surprise because it starts off um kind of abrasive like vincent gallo in this movie is mm-hmm. a huge jerk he's his personality is is completely unlikable and i even when i first saw it it's like how like how is this like, how am I going to care by the end uh, about this dude? Like mm. this nobody. And uh, miraculously Gallo, Gallo's writing his performance um, and his uh, direction just uh, really j- just, flo- just floors me. Like how uh, beautiful this movie is and like how uplifting it is, which again, first time I saw it, did not expect it at all. I, I thought this was going to be more of like a mean spirited movie. Like going in, I thought this was going to be like some knockoff of like, I don't know the, the the doom generation just from like the poster, but it is <laughs> absolutely not a, a very uh, pure movie about, I mean, a lot of things about like love about like uh, really dysfunctional families. Um, and it's just treated in a way that's, it's, it's very human. This is a very human movie, a very beautiful movie with a mm-hmm. lot of um, amazing, amazing uh, sequences in it involving on uh, music two in particular, Oh um, yeah, with, with uh, one of which is with uh, Vincent Gallo's uh, father in the movie played um, by Ben Gazzara, Jackie um, Treehorn from Big Lebowski. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one in a bowling alley involving Christina Ricci, which is still oh, yeah. awesome. love that scene. It's a perfect, perfect scene. Yeah. Perfect also, scene. don't forget about the last sequence in the film involving music by the band Yes fucking fantastic oh yeah, yeah. Love that scene too yeah this movie has like a killer soundtrack and like every Amazing. music in it um just serves a purpose it is so memorable and just so good and um it's it's not a it's it is a movie that has very very out there choices um especially with its uh kind of like i wouldn't say it's a centerpiece or maybe it is with like uh this like family reunion dinner or Vincent Gallo brings Christina Ricci to meet his parents. It lasts like a very long time, but the way I Gallo um, like lets the humor through the scene flow and um, uh, while making it feel like very awkward at the same time, is just so awesome. And um, it just works. It works amazingly. And this movie, it was just such a huge surprise. It's by far just one of my favorite um, movies of the nineties, just for uh, how singular it is. Um, 
I mean, it just has like really like cult classic like written all over it. I don't think enough people. It is a movie that is popular, but I don't think enough people have seen this movie um, as much like as like a Big Lebowski because um, <laughs> I, I like um, kind of compare these movies a little bit. They both came out in '98. There's like a huge emphasis on bowling <laughs> at a at a point. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, incredible movie, just super super memorable, and definitely just one of my favorites of the '90s. Love that you picked that. I like Thank I said. I, I told you guys before that that was I was gonna be in my top five, but I switched it out for Twin Peaks, especially when Mike had said that's gonna be in his top five. But I I have the movie. I love the film. Um, this is a movie I was very obsessed with, like when I was in college, sort of discovering more films. This was like to me, it was like one of the greatest independent films I'd ever seen. I still stick by that. It's one of the greatest debuts and sort of character oh. character studies romances ever put to film and you know vincent gallo say what you will about what he turned into but like this was this was such a lightning in a bottle that. film just so pr- incredible and hilarious i think it's a very funny movie uh, at times like really yep. darkly funny like his him just like talking about how he's like i'm used to driving luxury cars not this piece of shit like <laughs> stick shift car <laughs> Like Dude. right after she kidnaps Christina Ricci, it's just like what am I watching right now? But I, I'm, I'm. It's just so infectiously directed and acted. Uh, you're just along for it, and just so many revealing things. Like one of the most revealing movies about any person, actors ever. So totally agree with everything you said too. It's just, it's just such a perfect film. I feel really lucky that I got to see Buffalo 66 in uh, 35 millimeter this year. And oh, that's amazing. Uh, it's one of the best movie experiences I had in a quite a long time. Cause everybody was so into the film and like, luckily everybody was laughing like during the times I would expect them to laugh. So it was just a great time overall. Like, during the spanning time sequence, I was yeah, yeah. dying to the point where I, I couldn't fucking breathe. It was so funny. We're in here spanning time. Spanning time. <laughs> Every- <laughs> I don't want to waste another dollar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, dude, God. I I I really love that film. I, I dude, I don't think I've seen it in like three years or something, but yeah, it's I, been a while. But I really, really love that film. Uh, I'm glad you picked it, Mike, because I think it's awesome. Um, yeah, and that that again, that sequence in the then we get the third act with uh that song by yes, but I don't I don't want to give away to spoil it. But that song in particular, like I already loved that song. Like that was a song that I knew like for years before I even saw that film and I really loved it. So and when that, it's so crazy because like I would listen to that song and I thought to myself, oh, this would like, like, like I even thought to myself, I was like, well, I think one day I could try to like get the rights to this and like use it in a film or something. I think, I think it'd be really cool. And then I watched this, I'm like, oh, well, fuck. There it is right there. <laughs> Gallo beat you to the punch. Oh, damn. Yeah. But it was like, he used it so well. Like he used it to like the most of its potential. And I, I extremely admire him for that. Like he used it so fucking well. Like the, 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 the sound of the song is blended just so incredibly well with like the visuals and yeah, just really, really great stuff. The energy yeah. of that scene is fucking insane. Yep. Like, it oh, really yeah. gets you like, I don't know, pumped. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it really does. The, the visual style of this movie is incredible. Like Gallo always talked about how he was influenced by like Ozu films and like German expressionism and stuff. Like it's a really visually just pleasing movie on, uh, you know, in terms of the, the look of it and like what Mike said, the film grain and stuff. Um, also, like if you guys haven't seen the video of Vincent Gallo talking to the critics about this movie, it's one of the funniest Vincent Gallo things ever because he's just obliterating all these cr- critics who didn't like the movie <laughs> and just like going after their personal lives and everything. It's so funny. What? Um, I gotta watch that. <laughs> just search Vincent Gallo versus the critics on YouTube. You got. You will not be disappointed. <laughs> You know, um, his, his whole uh, feud with uh, Roger Ebert. Um, oh my God! Yeah, for the brown bunny. Yeah, he wished uh, he wished cancer on uh, Roger Ebert, and his wish <laughs> his wish came true. Well, I quote unquote, uh, I put a hex on uh, Ebert, and holy like, fuck, <laughs> he's a witch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But then Gal is a fucking witch, dude. <laughs> <laughs> they made up, I think, later on. But yeah, it was like so funny. 
Um, yeah, great movie. <laughs> um, yep. um, I I feel like we're all we all advocate for it pretty hard. So yep. I foresee good things happening for it later on. <laughs> uh, Blair, what's your number three? So for my number three pick, I think I am going to go with probably the most wholesome of uh, our picks. So this is Funny Games by director <laughs> Michelle Hanukkah. Hell yeah. I love that film. I, I, you, you actually tricked me. I was waiting for something wholesome. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I was like smiling. Yeah, I was like, oh. <laughs> no, well, uh, this is a film by my uh, favorite director, Um uh, so there's anybody who knows this movie knows there's two versions of it. And um, for, for a while, I did prefer the remake also directed by the same director. Um, but after watching both like more than twice, I, I definitely think I prefer the 97 one just literally based off how in, insanely visceral this experience is like, mm-hmm. Um, the two performances by the the parents in this film, they're gut wrenching. Like I can't yep. that is an understatement. Like the fucking uh faces they make and like the way they're genuinely terrorized is like really hard to sit through. Yep. Yeah. And um I love anxiety inducing movies like a lot. Those are like my favorite. And um honestly, the first time like you see that eggs the egg scene like play out, I was and intensely uncomfortable like i was just like god damn it and and obviously the film just spirals from there like it just completely like uh sets you up for something normal and then just goes this down this really deep dark path of just like toying with this family and also toying with the audience um a lot of a lot of people don't like this movie because they feel it's kind of preachy Personally, I don't feel that way. I definitely think that the director had like something he really wanted to say in a very abrasive way. But um, I don't personally think it's like saying, hey, stop enjoying like violent movies. To me, it's kind of more like a like a thought exercise or like some kind of like way to get you to think of how you kind of enjoy movies, uh, especially violent movies, because He's right. Um, You know, you watch a movie like Scream or some shit and it's like you're kind of just having fun with at the end of the day, people getting fucking sliced and uh, and and murdered. But this is like done in a way where you're like you unless you're a fucking like psychopath, you do not root for the fucking villains of this movie. Like you just want to see the suffering stop. And um, I mean, I don't necessarily want to spoil it, but it's a. it doesn't really end on the happiest of endings. Um, this movie is pretty much the uh, definition of unforgiving. And um, obviously it's famous for not having that much, um, even at all. Like there's like practically no on-screen violence, but yet it feels like one of the most violent movies you've ever seen because of uh, how well the direction and um, acting is. It's um it's pretty much up there in like um in the conversation of like uh solo and stuff when in terms of being like the most disturbing films. But um it, it could like honestly have like a, a BG 13 rating if it came out today, just because there's no like gore or anything. But um mm, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Because he uses a lot of like sound design in the off-screen space to like get in the audience's head what exactly is happening. And it makes it even more terrifying at times. And I think like Hanukkah was brilliant for being able to do that in this film. Absolutely. And uh, there's like, there's like one sequence in particular that from a filmmaking standpoint, it's like insane. It it involves like a a very, very, very long take where a character has to like do these actions that like, there's no like getting around it. She's actually doing these like um, these like really tough actions that their character has to experience. I, I, I'm keeping it vague just in case you haven't seen it, but it's it's intense. Um, but yeah, I don't know what else I could add to funny games. I think it's a one of a kind experience. Yeah, yeah, it's an incredible movie for sure. Um, I. I always forget that there was an American remake and I funny I've heard a few people say they prefer 
the American remake, which I haven't seen, but there's something about not knowing who the actors are in the original that I feel like might might be what I prefer. Because I know the remake has like Naomi Watts and Tim Roth, right? And it's like that's one of the things that I I, I love that you pointed that out. That um, I mean, it's hard to um. I mean, it's, it makes it better that, like, the actors in, like, the original are, like, more people, like, you've never seen, unlike, like, Naomi yeah. Roth, because um, I saw the, I saw Funny Games for the first time when I was, like, 11, and um, Jesus. Just, like, it's just, like, art house movie with, like, <laughs> these actors I've never seen in these just horrible scenarios just made it all the more disturbing and just, uh, like, unforgettable. Um, it, was, it just really felt like I was just witnessing, like, a real family um, just yeah. being completely Implemented by these. Yes. And also to me, like a fucking huge thing about it too is that the the first one, it it does like when it comes to the um uh, like color grading and the color palette, the original, it's a lot more natural looking. Like when you compare the 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 color palette and the color grading with the remake, the, the American remake looks it has that like classic 2000s like color like dull color grading kind of look like it's very gray and um just looks like uh, it's like void of like any natural color it just looks kind of yeah. very again just looks gray as hell it does but, look like 2000s horror sorry to interrupt thing yeah thank you like it but like the original it just looks like you're like uh, all the lighting looks natural and every like, and, and the and the color grading looks natural so i think that adds to that level of like authenticity along with the fact that we don't really know, you know, as Americans, we don't really know who these actors are really. Mm -hmm. And like, and the, and the performances like Blair touched on are more visceral. Like they just come off a lot more like just, you could feel the suffering from the family. I think a bit more in the original than like in the remake. And Mm. that's saying a lot because I mean, Tim Roth and um, Naomi Naomi Watts. Watts, Naomi Watts is in the remake and they're fucking phenomenal actors, but something about the way, the suffering of this family is portrayed in the original, like Blair said, it comes off more visceral. And um, I think those two things. Real. Yeah. And it totally does. The performances. And again, I think the color grading just kind of go a long way with the original. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, I want to admit that I haven't seen a lot from Mikel Hanukkah at this point. I've seen the, the piano teacher that. Um, I think it's called like 71 Fragments and a more. So you haven't seen did, the cachet? I have not seen the cachet. <laughs> the cachet. Uh, that's definitely where I want to go next. But I've always, you know, honestly, okay. fun, funny games and piano teacher were so hard for me to watch. I, it's kind of hard for me to go back. Um, that's but understandable. I, I, I do eventually want to conquer Mikkel, Mikkel's filmography because there's so many like compelling looking movies like the is it the white ribbon i think it's like the black and white one that looks really interesting um oh, i know great. you got i know you guys adore cachet so that's like that's, that's always his, high on my must see masterpiece yeah, yeah to me to <laughs> me that's his to me that that's his best film in my opinion i i'd agree I, yeah I'd agree. that film is oh my okay. god that movie is just really hard to pick a favorite from hanukkah honestly i've seen everything up until funny enough his last three movies so like um yeah Ribbon Amour and a uh, happy end um but yeah like i love funny games piano teacher is amazing i love 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 uh the seventh continent which is actually his, me like, too debut. me it's too gets yeah better that's like his debut right that's his first yeah. movie basically yeah, yeah. damn debut. that movie's that fucked up like that movie ruined my day <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, not is. a lot of really movies is. ruin my day but that movie put me in a shit mood the whole time <laughs> <laughs> the amazing part is like not much like really even happens on screen in that movie yet it's like so just yeah. horrifically uncomfortable and just like awful to sit through but there's not really like that much on screen kind of like funny yeah, game. yeah. but um i i don't even know which one like i i'd say impacted was like more impactful they're both so disturbing and just so it's it's uh, weird with the with the uh, seventh continent because it's like, it's almost like the symbolic gestures of that movie is just what mm-hmm. fucks you up so much. <laughs> Jesus like, Christ! Like it's not even like it's not even like I mean yeah the context is fucked up too but like again it's not even about necessarily like you know characters or gore or anything like that. It's a lot to me at least what I got out of it. It's a lot about observation. 
honestly. Yes, like and 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 what we just see unfold, um, again, symbolically speaking, with these characters, yep. and the actions that unfold with them is just like it's just it's almost unlike anything I've seen. Just the way yeah. that it's kind of put together, and the fact that this was like Hanukkah's first film, basically, is just kind of mind blowing because it's so effective. Jesus. It's a fantastic well, movie, yeah. Well, yeah. damn, that gives me a big incentive to watch that next. So, um, yeah, it's great. What year did the piano teacher come out? Is that the yeah. 2000? 2001? Yeah, I feel like there's going to be a big fight for the 2000s that are cachet. So, I know, uh, yeah, well, I know Carlos is going to go for one, I'll let him go for that one, but I got a different one. In my <laughs> no, I know that's what I'm saying. I know, yeah. I know you guys is taste so i know it's gonna i'm gonna try to watch cachet before that episode by the way so oh please do uh, i will i will uh, i know the piano teacher is a masterpiece so I, I know that that's my favorite i've seen I, by far i agree king i agree <laughs> <laughs> it's so good it's so good okay um oh yeah carlos you're next yeah you're number three all right so my number three is a pretty fucking obscure pick um <laughs> I don't think like very many people have seen this film. So, oh, cool. um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm sorry if it's not like something that you've ever heard of, but uh, right. it's, it's a film called Toy Story 2. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, I'm sorry. Like I have to pick this movie. This is my favorite animated film of all time. Um, and I know it's cliche. And I know it's not like a normie saying that, but like this film to me is genuinely brilliant. Um, I mean, I really couldn't ask more for like an animated film that's mainly aimed towards children, but it's still so incredibly compelling for adults. This right here is just like the masterpiece of that. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, what can I say? Uh, I think it's perfect in every way. Um I just love like all of the themes, all of the character arcs. Uh, the animation is really great, especially you know in comparison to the first one. A lot of people kind of dog on the animation of the first one, which I I get. Um, but it is early on, you know, in the '90s, so it's kind of understandable why like computer animation wasn't at its best at the time. But like you know, to me, the animation in Toy Story Two still holds up pretty well. Um, it's really very great. well, yeah. Um, and uh yeah i mean the humor is fantastic uh the new characters that are incorporated into the film like jesse and bullseye and uh stinky pete stinky pete <laughs> the prospector <laughs> stinky pete <laughs> um and they're all wonderful characters and they all have their place in the story and the themes um that the the one sequence with jesse's song it is it is oh the my most, god devastating cry. song i've ever heard almost devastating sequence that i've seen in any animated film really i'm with you um, god and so good it's just i mean all i have to do is hear like the first piano notes and i'm already in tears <laughs> like too man and it's just Same. oh it's so hard it's just a beautifully heartbreaking sequence about about a lot of things it's i mean you i mean in one way it's about how we all grow up and abandon the things that we used to love. And another way it's, it's about, you know, it's a whole other layer to it. And like trying to imagine what those things that we abandoned, what if they could feel that? And it's just, Oh my oh. God, it is so fucking heartbreaking. Um, but so beautifully done. Just, I love that sequence. So good. Um, but yeah, again, like overall, I just think like in terms of narrative, in terms of humor, in terms of animation, uh, in terms of incorporating new characters into the mix, um, it's just all masterfully done. And again, I think this is like the earliest memory I have in a theater as well, as I mentioned earlier. So um, yeah, this is, I mean, in a way, I guess it's a personal pick, but at the same time, I feel like objectively speaking, I think it deserves a spot here. So um, yeah. I I'll stop talking about it, but I just yeah I love Toy Story two to death. That's why it's number three mm -hmm. on my list. I just want to point out only on this podcast we can go from talking about Mikel Hanukkah Toy Story <laughs> two in such a seamless fashion. So I, I think, think it's a base pick. I think it's a base. No, I I awesome. it's my favorite Pixar movie. So I'm just I'm overjoyed that you brought it up. Um, 
honestly was like heavily considering putting it on my list and I saw you put it on and I was I felt vindicated Um, because I genuinely (laughs) until I talked to you about it I never met besides like me and my siblings no one else loves that movie as much that I come across like which is shocking because I'm like it's like Pixar's magnum opus like at least in my eyes and like they people go towards like later films like up and like Wally and stuff which are great but like Toy Story 2 is just your what you said about like it's 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 a complete film above like the Pixar formula like every Mm -hmm. there's character arcs there's like the whole the montage where he uh he fixes Woody up um is like just so artfully edited and animated like it's so it's so gorgeous and like it's the themes are so relatable for an animated movie like it's like the first animated movie yeah. i remember i was like i could like really see myself in these characters and like in this world it's just um, yeah like the, the yeah. part where, where you mentioned where he's like um uh cleaning up woody and then he uses mm-hmm. like the very ending of it he, he uses the paintbrush to paint over the the name andy oh over God. his boot i'm like that is just like visual storytelling and it's visually storytelling yeah there you go exactly God. what it is God, even um, even Neymar Bergman can do that shit, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want Perry to get mad at me again. It's all right. <laughs> One thing I, that I rem- oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, go ahead. One thing that I that really sticks out to me, even as a kid, uh, and like to this day, is um, that third act of Toy Story. It like it like becomes almost like a Steven Spielberg like action film at the airport. Like that scene, those uh, sequences really stick out to me. How it's like, yeah, Indiana Jones at the airport or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like using that, con- the conveyor belts and like the luggage bags as like all these um, obstacles and stuff. Like it's really fun. I I love it so much. I do too. Mike, I'm, I'm sad you haven't chimed in yet. What's your, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been like, Probably well over a decade since I've seen Toy Story, <laughs> but um, or, I mean, I'm di- now I'm really dying to just give it another watch. Uh, I, I have been a um, I've been on a Disney kick lately, just like the classics. So um, I mean, we'll definitely fit that one in. Um, I, mean, I don't um, have to, you got to in so long, but no, that especially the way I uh, describe that one sequence, um, use utilizing visual storytelling is really amazing to me, and like I, I don't even remember. Uh, the movie being like that artful. I mean, I, I remember it being a great movie, obviously, but um, if you guys are holding it up to that uh, caliber, I mean, I got I got to rewatch it. So I mean, yeah, it's it's, it's great to hear. I mean, great, amazing pick. <laughs> like, it really props to you, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's been. I'm so. I'm just relieved because it's been a long journey of me trying to convince my friends that love Pixar too that it's the best one. And now I feel more vindicated because it's on the podcast and yeah. I don't think it's, I have a, like a definitive like favorite uh, Pixar, honestly. So, um, I mean, that probably is the best. I mean, if, if it's you guys are holding it up. That, it's, uh, not, it's canon now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my favorite. No. Yeah. It's not my favorite, but I do will say, I think it is like their best. I'd say my favorite's probably Monsters Inc. Still to this day. Monsters Inc.'s incredible. I love yeah. The Incredibles. No, mine's The Incredibles. <laughs> Incredibles is. Uh, I'm not surprised, Blair, but because it's it's my probably my favorite. But Toy Story Two is like the mo- the best. Yeah. If someone exactly. like put a gun to my head and said the best is Toy Story Two. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, it- we did a full episode of Toy Story Two. If you guys want to check that out, like two years ago. Really? <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> So much yeah. we love it here, yeah. A crazy thing about Toy Story 2 is that apparently it was like it was like essentially it was meant to just kind of be like a straight to DVD kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't even meant to be like this big, like great movie. Uh, but then like John Lasseter, I don't know what happened exactly, I forgot, but like John Lasseter, he either caught wind of it or like something happened, but like he basically got onto the project and he just completely like reformed everything and made it to where like you know this is actually going to be like a legit fucking movie and he turned it like a he turned like a straight to dvd kind of bullshit movie into like one of the most amazing sequels you've ever seen <laughs> it's true yeah you can imagine if that did go straight to dvd like god like a movie of that caliber that'd be shocking and that uh-huh. means like if that was the case that means we would have never gotten probably like toy story 3 or toy story 4 or anything like that no 
you guys do you want them to keep making Toy Story movies? Fuck or should no. They, should they hang no, it up? Not, no. <laughs> I'm yeah, down. No, they... <laughs> <laughs> I'm down for it. I don't give a fuck. I don't mind. They'll be they'll be pretty good. I like Toy Story four more than most people do, so I, I won't. Same. I don't care. It's not a great movie at all, but like I, I'm a fan. I, I think it's a great movie. The last like current. I own it. I'm Blu-ray. I, I, you know what? I'll say it's great too. Carlos. I'm not a fan. Hell yeah. <laughs> I think it's great. I mean, I mean that's, that's it's, fair. That's it's fair, not as good as any of the any of the previous ones, but it's still a great movie. Yeah, shout out to Josh Cooley. What a what a visionary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I'll say. Hell that. yeah, Josh Cooley. Props for me. <laughs> All right. Um, love that we got to talk about that today. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go. I'm gonna do my number three, and it's good to go based off Toy Story two because I also have like a family oriented film here. Um. Definitely one that young kids will like more than us, but fuck it, I gotta bring it up. It's uh Michael Mann's Heat. That was a joke. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> we all did the fake preamble, so I had to do it. Um no man, I mean Heat, uh well what, what else do I need to say? I'll keep it short. I think it's 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 one of the best crime epics in American history on film, in my opinion. I think it's Michael Mann, um, to my knowledge, like he 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 has a hard time getting films made. And like this film was like this, this film did not do as well as he had hoped, which is like so shocking to me and the apex of like two of the greatest actors of the yep. generation coming together. And it didn't like do gangbusters. I don't know how that's possible, but to me, like those, that's like two of the most underrated performances in their filmography. I think they're both magnificent in that movie. And I think people that love the movie put them to that regard, but I think Pacino and De Niro are so Pacino's so coked out and crazy that it's like it's it's hilarious. It comes full circle. It's being hilarious at times. It's just so he just takes so many risks as, as an actor. But like on on the flip side, like De Niro is so calculated and cool and and kind of like menacing. Like the the polar opposite sort of tones just clash so perfectly. It's just such a satisfying. Like you were saying, with Toy Story too. Like the the character arcs in this movie are so perfectly encapsulated towards the end um but everything about this movie like i think shooting on location in la it's like the way he shoots la is just so gorgeous and like memorably just so michael mann-esque and you know kind of like the blue tints and the 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 digital filmmaking is just so perfect has maybe the best shootout in cinema history uh downtown la shootout after the bank robbery goes wrong and like i was saying with sound design with twin peaks like it just shatters your eardrums um and yeah, like movie, but that shootout is freaking incredible. I, I've seen it like over. You saw it on you saw it on Watch Mojo or something. I'm sure <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the greatest <laughs> greatest shootouts in, in film. Um, but even the ensemble, like uh, John Voight to Val Kilmer and Danny Trejo and all these people, and William Fickner, it's just it's just the definition of a crime epic, in my opinion. Like in the likes of Scorsese and Coppola, um, and uniquely michael mann's vision and it's a movie that i watch probably once a year and it's like it never ceases to amaze me that he pulled off this such a daring ambitious and just i always just come back to this movie just such a satisfying watch every time and like the ending is just so magnificent um and it, you know it's long it's a long it's a, it, you truly feel like the weight and the emotions come full circle in this movie um, and the, of course, the coffee shop scene, how did I not mention that? Like one of the greatest pieces of conversation ever put to film and like it is really where shot reverse shot becomes like an art form, you know, when to cut to, to each of them, when to cut to a wide shot. Um, and the dialogue is just so profound. Um, so, yeah, um, the, the, the family oriented movie Heat uh, is one of my favorite movies. Um, what do you guys think about it? I uh, shout out to Bill, Bill Griff, because he pushed me to watch this movie for like honestly like a year straight he every single time i was like what should i watch tonight he would always reply heat <laughs> and finally this year i pulled the trigger and watched it and yeah oh, I, nice. I fucking love this movie a lot um pacino's performance in this movie is one of my fucking favorite things ever he's insane in this movie yep. um <laughs> and obviously robert de niro is no slouch he he kills it too um yeah those those two are like what make the movie for me like obviously all the um action elements which like there's they're kind of uh far away from each other but they're so memorable 
Uh, but the, the character moments between those two are genuinely like what make the film for me. Totally. What's uh, everyone's Pacino's. favorite Pacino quote from the movie? She got a great ass. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. That one um, with the TV where he's like, you can. Oh, yeah. So, you, 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 you can't can fucking my watch. wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't my watch TV. my television set. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I love when he's talking in the very beginning when he's interrogating someone. He just, they're sitting there like, give me everything you got. Just screams out of nowhere. <laughs> and they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> just like the perfect coked out Pacino energy brought to this movie. I've only seen it once and I liked it. I wasn't like that fucking huge on it, but I feel like I need to watch it again. I feel like I have a lot of fun with it if I watch it again. You have to. Um, Please do. <laughs> but yeah, I'm surprised I forgot- this made it. Sorry. I forgot the one quote from him, but it was, I don't want to quote it. I'm going to butcher it because I don't even know. I don't even remember what the fuck he said, but it was Pacino. like a part. Of, yeah, Pacino. Yeah. It was like a part where I don't know what act it was, but he went out. He's like, they're like looking for Robert De Niro and like his fucking gang oh, or whatever. <laughs> and he's like, he like knows that they're like, not, they're like looking at him from like afar and he's like, you're, you're, I forgot what he said. But he's like, you're you're looking at the FBI or something like that. I forgot what he the said. LA <laughs> Police Department. It. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that. That's such a great and, scene. At that point, he's like losing his mind. He hasn't slept in like five weeks, probably. Yeah. They're looking at us. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, Al Pacino is my favorite fucking actor. Like le- legitimately. He's, he's, he's oh, yeah. Favorite. He's up there as mine as well. Yeah. That that film kind of solidified it for me. He's like really up there too. I love him. <laughs> he's like when his wife is like breaking down. He's like, "You're never home." You're they're like at dinner. He's like, "You're never home." Like, what are we gonna do? He's like, when we hooked up, baby, I told you we, <laughs> this will be the deal. Just, <laughs> you can't talk normally in any conversation. He just has to bring <laughs> some sort of affectation or whatever, but. It is crazy too because at like the first half of his career, he's like very different with his performance. Like, I mean, not completely different, but like, yeah. As he gets older, he gained more of like a raspy like voice, and now <laughs> like he just he has like two halves of his career where he just like has completely different sticks to him. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, really great. I credit that to like Brian De Palma and he and Scarface probably yeah. changed his whole like idea of performing because he just went all out and he's like i gotta do that every time now i love I gotta do in scarface oh yeah god he's so good in that <laughs> i've never seen uh uh godfather pacino so i have no frame of reference oh yeah. he's yeah it's totally it, like what carlos so said different. completely different performance yeah. Still all amazing, i know though. is scarface oh he's he, yeah yeah godfather 2 like especially he's like on yeah. another level like, he should have won an oscar for that but whatever yeah, De Niro won, I believe, right? For uh, I think so for playing, playing young Vito. Yeah, Vito Corleone. Yeah. Um, um Mike, way, are you are you a Heat guy? Sorry, Carlo. Um, oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> I've never seen Heat. Uh, unfortunately, I've always been saving it for the right time because knowing, um, how like great um Michael Mann uh, captured that movie, like the action of like uh downtown LA and just uh, considering it's just like uh, this huge. It's crime epic. I, I've always been meaning to check it out at like the right moment. Um, but no, I sadly have not seen it as much as I really, really want to. Um, but yeah, no, that one shootout though, um, you brought up. Um, again, I've I've seen that one bit like over and over, and it really is like I gotta see this movie like right now. Um, I always <laughs> really admired Michael Mann like as a filmmaker. Though I think the only movie, uh, to my knowledge, I've seen from him is Collateral. Um. Love but that one. I, I love the way like he um like captures like a uh, nightlife um like in the city um he's a oh, very yeah. special filmmaker in terms of like uh, capturing like action so um definitely definitely a movie i want to get on like asap Heath is another michael mann that i highly recommend to people uh it's like really early on his first film i believe and that movie is just beautifully beautifully constructed and james con's incredible in it so i'm a bit i love michael mann i know we haven't talked about him on the this out uh, these decades yet but this is definitely the one to his magnum opus to bring up in my opinion so all right mike you're you're on your number two yes so i brought him up a little bit ago um danny boyle um so my number two pick is train spotting um what can i say about train spotting that hasn't really already been said i 
this is easily one of the most definitive movies of the 90s in just so many ways. I mean, culturally, I mean, was, I mean, this was a huge box office smash uh, when it came out overseas in the United States. I mean, the soundtrack was super popular. But uh, to me, I mean, Train Spotting is it's really a movie that's gotten better over time. I've had probably over a decade to sit with this movie. Uh, This is one of the earliest movies I saw in like my film journey. And it's one that I come away every time just getting something new um, and just really just constantly having my mind blown uh, by this movie, by just how timeless this movie's themes of like uh, addiction um, are um, it's, it's a movie that is, it's, it's very 90s. This is a very, very 90s movie, but this is a very timeless movie, I think, in its themes. Um, but it's, it's done with uh, so, so much style that I think Danny Boyle, while he's made some like really like awesome movies over the course of his career, I don't think he's ever captured better um, in Train Spotting. I mean, this movie, his direction in this movie is freaking crazy. Like um, some of the sequences in this in this movie have really just been burned into my memory forever. Um, I, I don't even know what, like where I could start. I mean, the the one that always comes to mind is um, the scene with Perfect Day, which I think is one of the best instances of um, uh, Danny's uh, direction in this movie. How creative and just how how mind bending this movie is for a movie that really is very dark and captures, I think, um, like really the horror of drug addiction in a very respectful way, in a very tasteful way. Um, but also in a way that's just, it's very, very fun, just like very like explosive. And um, again, I, I this is such a, a special movie to me that I, I always just get something new every time. Um, the cast is really just makes, just brings the movie to another level, uh, particularly Ewan McGregor, which I don't know if it is my favorite performance by him. It, it almost certainly is up there. Um, but I think he does such a good job in this movie. He's so committed, um, to like a lot, a lot in this movie, like physically, um, uh, mentally, I, I don't know. I mean, like how this movie, how, what his experience was on this movie, like behind the scenes, but, um, he puts so much, um, into this character of Renton that, um, is just so unforgettable, just goes through just so much over the course of just like 90 minutes. And that's another thing I love about this movie. This movie is like unbelievably well paced. Um, and quite a bit happens in the movie. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so much I could say about uh, Train Spotting, but I, I think it's it's one of my favorite movies of the 90s. I think it's one of the most like culturally uh, defining and um, just just really a movie where I wondered like what happened to this Danny Boyle? Not not to throw shade at his other movies because like I said I do enjoy a lot of his movies, but I think this is like like almost like a lightning in a bottle moment for him. Like he's never been better. It's by far my favorite thing he's ever directed, and um, yeah, um, amazing movie on all fronts. Just really powerful stuff. Real really just. I think, I mean, it's a movie that I think is pretty accessible, but at the same time, it goes many places. Um, just put that pushes the boundaries and just, just amazing movie all around. Totally. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> the soundtrack's incredible too. The Iggy Pop mm-hmm. and like New Order, Lou Reed, like, God, it's like such one of the best soundtracks of any 90s movie I can think of. Um, and re- I rewatched that movie like a couple months ago, actually. And I was always struck by not only the drug addiction aspect, but like the third act of this movie is really him like dealing with the fallout of his lifestyle, which I always loved. It's kind of like him, it's kind of becomes like a coming of age sort of movie in a way where he's trying to find his place in the world. And like obviously it ends awry and like sort of the they kind of resort back to their old ways. And the sequel that came out a few years ago expands upon that. But yeah, like. I, I agree. I'm a big Danny Boyle fan, especially his earlier films. And like, there's he's such a explosive, just like visual style and sensibilities as a filmmaker, just so interesting. Um, and that's definitely his easily his best movie, in my opinion. So I agree with you. <clears throat> yeah. And there's so many like memorable sequences in that movie, too. Um, like the first like overdose type sequence is really creatively oh my God, done. Yeah um the fucking toilet sequence 
beautiful um yeah. the fucking withdrawal sequence with the fucking baby oh like, my god there's so many just memorable really great and creative uh types of uh filmmaking moments that like you just can't help but fucking appreciate and love so yeah i also really love that movie a lot yes yeah blair do you got any thoughts on uh train spotting uh i like train spotting um but it didn't honestly it didn't really connect with me as much as i thought it would especially with all the praise it got but i mean by no means it's it's like it's a great movie and uh culturally defining is probably the best way to put it when it comes to what it did for films in the 90s and yeah yeah i don't, I don't see danny boyle like topping it like if i watch any of his other movies you don't think yesterday yesterday is a better movie? <laughs> the Beatles. No, wasn't gonna bother with that shit. <laughs> I actually kind of want to see it. I don't know why, but I maybe you're still a like Beatles fan. Yeah, I love the Beatles. Oh, there so, you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does fit perfectly in that '90s mold of like post Pulp Fiction films that were very, you know, kind of mm-hmm. personal crime movies that were very underground, sort of visceral movies. So. Um, a lot of British movies like Guy Ritchie, Danny Boyle, obviously we're doing them. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's a great movie to definitely define the 90s with. Definitely. Um, uh, Blair, what's your number two? My number two is a film from Mr. Parent Teacher Association <laughs> called Boogie Nights. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> uh, not my original joke. I forgot who I stole that from. But um. Oh my god, Boogie Nights is a movie like I remember when I first watched. I was like, you know, uh, PTA is such a great filmmaker, but this is like always ranked among like his uh, lowest. So I just threw it on one day before like <laughs> before a day of work, and I was like, holy fuck, that was a fucking masterpiece. I to me, it's personally one of my favorite uh, PTA films. It's one of the most entertaining films I've ever seen. Uh, anytime I watch it, that runtime just uh, flies by. It's a, uh, it's a. Uh, I hear it getting compared to, to like Goodfellas and stuff a lot. And um, personally, I don't really see see it that way. Like there are similarities with it being like an ensemble cast, and it's about like this kind of CD organiz- organization or you know time and place if that makes sense but uh i think uh it really makes great use of like that porn industry um in the film and uh everybody's performance is fucking fantastic i i'm not a fan of mark Wahlberg like at all but he does an incredible well uh he does a great job in the in this movie um he's like kind of the perfect casting for for his character and um Man, I love how kind of like almost lighthearted and uh, fun the the majority of the film is. And then it just has a completely dark uh, tone shift in like the third act. It's it, to some people it's like jarring, but to me, I I love it. It it makes the movie like a little more compelling. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to think of what else I could see. It just uh, it, it's like. It's not maybe not one of his most like thought provoking films. Like I would probably give that to like There Will Be Blood or even like The Master. But um, I don't know. I I definitely think there's so much like expert creativity and expert directing in Boogie Nights that's like undeniable. And um, I wouldn't fault anybody for having it as their favorite uh, PTA film because this movie is just it's so entertaining. It's so funny. And it's expertly crafted, in my opinion. That that ending scene, or not? The, no, it's not the ending scene, but that sequence with like Jesse's girl and the fucking uh, yeah, the drug Alfred the Molina, dr- yeah, yeah, Alfred Love Molina, that moment. Sister Christian. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> There's so many like layers to what makes that scene work. It's it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, how do you guys feel about Boogie Nights? Amazing. Love it. Love I it. Love it. Love it. I adore it. I think um I think anyone's PTA's favorite movie every anyone's favorite PTA is, could be any of his films, you know, besides Heart Eight, maybe or Inherent Vice. <laughs> um and Boogie Nights for a while was my favorite movie. 
my favorite PTA movie. Um, it's kind of shifted, but I still everything you said, I totally agree. It's just how infectious and high energy it is in the first two thirds. I just love, and it's just so fun and lighthearted, and uh, the camera movement, the one takes, and the soundtrack, everything how it culminates is so perfect. And then getting really dark in the third act, like I never, I saw that movie really early on in my film watching days. And that was like a really shocking, like twist of tone. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. So totally. I, I adore book. Yeah. I, I could say so much more about it, but for time's sake. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Incredible yeah. movie. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that there's like this one, like cross cutting section where the tone gets really fucking dark. And I was like, yeah. Whoa, some of the best cross cutting ever. My yeah. God. Like, between like three different plot lines going yep. on. It's like, God. Uh, just Burt really Reynolds, great filmmaking. Burt Reynolds and Julianne Moore also, I got to say, are just fantastic in that movie. Got Oscar nominated for, for that movie too, which I don't know if a lot of people remember, but um, they absolutely deserved it. I mean, especially Burt Reynolds, such a rest in peace. But, um, Rip, made, yeah. Um, well, now like fucking Mark Wahlberg is ashamed of this movie because he's a little know. bitch. <laughs> Little pussy ass bitch. Little pussy ass <laughs> bitch. I don't. That's fuck why with you. That's why I was like, oh, uh, like Mark Wahlberg's really great in the film, but no, uh, Burnt Reynolds and uh, Julianne Moore are by far my favorite performances of the film. Oh yeah, John yeah. C. Riley, I love in this movie too. He's great. Yeah. His sidekick. Phil William Macy. Oh. William Macy. Don Cheadle. Like everyone just comes to life in this movie. So, and I credit that PTA script is like. One of the best like early scripts of any filmmaker that just like gives any actor so much to pull from and like you like we're saying with like character arcs like this movie is some of the best fulfilling character arcs ever in any movie I can think of you know like when the Beach Boys song is playing at the end and like every you see everyone's life kind of like shifted or stayed the same it's like ah oh, it just brings chills to my body thinking about that ending. Mm-hmm. I'm a star. I'm a star. I love it. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about PTA definitely more in the 2000s. I'm sure oh, we yeah. all will. Um, he made many masterpieces later on. But um, Carlos, what's your number two for the 90s? All right. So my number two is um, a film that really I should shout out Blair because he was pushing me to watch this film before I even knew who this director was or what this film was or really anything. And it's a film called The Celebration. Oh, nice. Um, yes. Yeah, this film rocked my socks off. Um, Thomas Vinterberg now, I mean, at least with the film, I mean, even like even like um, 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 Another Round, which is like his more recent work, um, but, you know, especially with The Hunt and now, and, and The Celebration, he um, he deals with such like heavy and mature content in such a delicate and nuanced way that I just respect so much. Like here with the celebrations specifically, it's about abuse. I won't go, I won't tell you like exactly what abuse it is for those who haven't seen it yet, but it's basically a film that's about abuse and kind of explores in depth as to why um, victims of abuse are silenced. And it's, I mean, it is it's part of the Dogma 95 movement where, you know, filmmakers like Lars von Trier and Harmony Kareen and uh, obviously Thomas Vinterberg, they were using basically like bare bones filmmaking. Like they couldn't use like any kind of like production value, really. They had to make a film out of bare bones equipment. And he made something that just felt so fucking raw, so authentic, so insightful, so emotionally heartbreaking. and he just delivers a powerhouse um, of an art piece here. It is so engaging from start to finish. And um, just the way that, again, that he handles these themes, the way that he handles the narrative and how the themes unravel within the narrative. um, And the way he just kind of concludes everything within this film is just, just, it's a, it's a piece of artistry that I just admire so much. Um, yeah, it's again, this is this is a film that, you know, I would kind of, I guess, proceed with caution. Um, it's not like graphic or anything, but it does deal with like heavy subjects about abuse. And um, but the way it handles it, it just it, it handles what 
it, it handles it with such maturity um, and in a way that I just, I just respect so much. And it, overall, like, I think this film in terms of the writing, the directing, the acting uh, is pitch perfect. Um, everything about it is masterful and I wouldn't change a damn thing about it. It's just beautifully written. I love the way all the characters are woven throughout the narrative and it's just a fucking brilliant film overall. It's just such an impactful and emotionally moving piece of filmmaking and I can't recommend it enough. So yeah, that's why it's number two. I love this film so much. You know, I, I watched this for the first time a few days ago. Um, cause I knew we were going to, so when it, we were at least going to bring it up um, in this episode. So, and I, I agree with everything you said. I was blown away by this Hell movie yeah. and the, the stylistic choices were so interesting. The editing choices were so crazy and experimental, but, and like the way things are revealed about abuse and like childhood trauma are so profound mm-hmm. in this movie and just stick with you. Like there's, there's character moments that just stick with you for a lot. Long- it's only been a few days, but I just can't get out of my head. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I agree. Thomas Vinterberg is one of, in my in my eyes, one of our greatest working filmmakers based on every movie I've seen from him now. Like the three we've mentioned are all perfect movies, in my opinion, and like yep. 10 out of 10 masterpieces. So I agree. I think I think it has a rightful place on your on your top five. I didn't uh, bring it up because I knew somebody else was going to bring it up. But yeah, <laughs> celebration goes so fucking hard. <laughs> it goes hard. <laughs> a weird Criterion cover, but you know, yeah, I kind of, I kind of dig it. Jesus, the Jesus cover. <laughs> That's so good. The the fucking uh, menu screen has "I Am a God" playing. Eight oh eight just blaring when you press the. <laughs> Black skinhead plays in the credits. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you know, a great movie about high society, too. I love I mean, we've been all loving Succession recently. And like this was kind of a great companion piece to like what we've been seeing on there in a way, just like these mm. elite families that are so far gone. And like they mentioned like Freemasons in this movie, I remember, and just mm. like terrifying like how how you know it felt so real and like you, you're kind of trapped with these people for like two hours it was it's really something um so i'm, I'm happy I mean, mike have you seen it i've only seen out of the haunt and uh, another round but i mean both of those movies are phenomenal um i don't know why it's taken me so long to see the celebration but um i will get there one day and I'm, well, I you, you, you listen to yeezus right so i have to <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay that's uh, that's your number two i'll do mine mm-hmm. really really quick because mike already brought it up um which is taste of cherry um i you know <laughs> don't have much more to add i think you summed it up perfectly but i i always loved what agnes varda talked about this movie once really briefly and she said the desire to die is so hard to to portray on screen um and kind of encapsulate all the emotions that one must go through before a suicide and i feel like that movie someone like kirstami who's so meditative and and kind of just intimate with his subjects like i feel like that's the perfect filmmaker to tackle that sort of subject matter like you said um and i kirstami's always been labeled as the driving filmmaker you know someone who depicts characters within the confines of their car and i always found this film to just like utilize that enclosed space of the car and kind of contemplative nature of driving by yourself and the landscape sort of like informing uh the emotion as they go which i think is really interesting and i i feel like that movie is next to some of the the cocker trilogy does it like the best um i said the cocker tri- trilogy without even like a pause i just call it that now. Uh, i think that came from you mike i'm pretty sure yeah it, it was the cocker trilogy. <laughs> but yeah no i think it's a masterpiece i have nothing really else to add i think it's one of the best like final 20 minutes of any film like you're saying with that final interaction like yeah. i i i to literally this movie took my breath away at multiple points and Kiristami is a master, and uh, that's really all I have to say. I know <laughs> you said you said it perfectly before, so that is my sentiment. Unless any of you guys have any other taste of cherry things to add, but 
um it's great yeah um, it's a great it's a great movie <laughs> great fucking movie <laughs> taste <of> cherry. <laughs> <laughs> um and like i said i can't wait to talk about kiristami later on which i know we will uh but mike yes your numero numero uno film My numero uno is a little unknown movie a little unknown <laughs> indie movie called the shawshank redemption <laughs> is it a24 i never heard of it <laughs> is it a yeah. neon release <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, but I freaking love this movie so much. And I mean, I know, I mean, there's not really much more I can add to it, to the decades, I mean, of reflection and ad- ad- adoration this movie has had. But um, to me personally, I mean, the Shawshank Redemption is pretty much like the, the epitome of like, I'd say like a perfect movie. I mean, I won't say, I mean, it is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life, but um, it is in terms of, I mean, my own film experience, this is one of the closest movies I can think of to just like being completely flawless, just on every uh, facet uh, possible. I mean, the the performances in this movie and like, um, especially like Morgan Freeman's uh, narration are just so, just so like freaking flawless. Like every, there's not a weak link in this cast. Like everybody adds something um to andy dufresne's um journey throughout this movie which spans a really long freaking time um but there's not like a single moment in this movie that doesn't have some sort of significance or that doesn't add to the um this movie's message about like hope and um uh, just just it's just incredible i mean from like um uh brooks uh to tommy um like the warden like everyone just brings so much to this movie and um so many just unbelievably amazing moments that are just rank among some of my favorite uh sequences in movie history like brooks's monologue or uh like the last just even like the last couple minutes of this movie um are just so good and just so emotionally uh breathtaking um frank darabont's direction in this movie that this most recent viewing i had which is like a mo- about a month or two ago i just casually watch this movie like every couple of years and it really is like the gift that keeps on giving um i've had i mean i've had like many 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 years to to kind of sit on it um j- j- just really amazing and uh, roger deakins obviously did the cinematography too so this movie looks um immaculate and um so many just beautiful um just beautiful takes just um just really brings the setting of the Shawshank uh, prison to life so well just I mean it is horrible and it's it's super ugly but um Frank Darabont brings just so much like humanity and just light in this um just awful setting that I think is super admirable and it just makes me really sad that Frank Darabont kind of I mean more or less just like quit filmmaking I'm not sure um the only other movie I have seen from him what is like The Mist unless I'm blanking on anything else, but um, I, I Green think... Green Mile was one. Green Mile. I, I haven't seen the Green Mile, unfortunately. No. Um, but no, his his vision for this movie and, like, the way he just captured these emotions and, like, this message is just really just, uh, just a complete triumph, in my opinion. And, yeah, I mean, it's my favorite movie of the 90s. I personally believe it's the best. Um, yeah, not much more I can add, just amazing movie just brilliant movie just on every single facet in my opinion nice my personal favorite scene of that movie is the opera scene when he's he locks the guards in the bathroom and they're all kind of like i I like honestly tear up just thinking about that just like because there's an amazing crane shot of like everyone listening to the music and it's like holy fuck just god it's it's just a beautiful movie it's my shout out to my mom that's her favorite movie of all time so i i definitely have a special connection because like we watched that movie all the time growing up and i still i still love it so i'm happy you brought it up and you're so passionate about it too yeah we actually recently watched and discussed that film in my discord which five dollars a month by the way you can join discord (laughs) um but yeah it was a blast talking about that film because i hadn't seen it in so long and when i rewatched it i was like damn yeah i i completely understand why this movie is hailed like as highly as it is um yeah i love i love the shawshank redemption everything that you said mike I, I i completely agree with it it's fucking awesome yep blair are you a shawshank uh, uh um i think it's a really good movie <laughs> <laughs> 
Cool. You didn't want to see it for a while, didn't you? Like, I remember that. You're pretty. <laughs> well, Perry, Perry was the one. Okay, so Perry, like, uh, we had like a movie night together, IRL, and um, yeah, I was a. Uh, I was pretty happy for that experience because I got to watch it with a good friend of mine. Um, but I mean, like, you know, it's I think it's a good movie. I, the, I mean, the whole like, hail, I don't know. It, it's like people really love it. And I'm like, I'm happy for them. I'm just like, well, you know, damn, you're never going to be invited to the IMDb party that I'm throwing. <laughs> <laughs> 2000 of all time party. <laughs> the top two we're gonna watch all of them dude <laughs> go through all the christopher nolan movies yeah <laughs> inception. <laughs> inception number five <laughs> like is that number five holy no, shit it's, it's like top 20 though i think, I think the dark knight's like number five right yeah it is god what a what a, what a shit show <laughs> that website should be like they put on a flash drive and burned in a volcano or something like, <laughs> <laughs> what a joke <laughs> like 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 in the Lord of the Rings, is did you take a trip to a volcano? It's to done. Show them in there. <laughs> we gotta get Elijah Wood to do it for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I love no no Loki. I I love the movie. I'm not you know, but I could nah, see I it is one of the most you know talked about you know movies mm-hmm. ever yeah. made. I'm I'm yeah. not trying. Yeah, I'm not trying to like invalidate anybody's experiences. That's why I'm just like no saying, no yeah yeah. I mean it just didn't connect with me as much as everybody yeah else. yeah it's just totally fair um carlos you looking for the blu-ray <laughs> i was looking for a blu-ray but i can't find it so i'll save it i got it look at that. oh yeah i have a really cool blu-ray i don't know where the fuck i put it but yeah but it has like a cool booklet and shit with it oh, oh hell yeah the, the digibook yeah i got this like fucking walmart brand cover here <laughs> you can barely even see it but i bought mine this... like five bucks yeah mine's... i think so yeah mine's the same cover but it's a digi book as, but it's a digi book yeah yeah i but... yeah frank darabont i don't know what the hell happened to him but like uh, i'm pretty <laughs> sure the mess was like the last thing he ever drank and i was oh seven just crazy I, I don't know, like, yeah I really like the style. I mean, while he was around, I mean, definitely got a little bit more um, rough around the edges. I like uh, the mist, how he went more handheld, but I, I like his really like raw approach to like, um, just like human drama. I, I think he had a very distinct style. And um, I mean, hopefully one day he'll come back, but I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Sadly. Um, but yeah, great pick Blair. What's your number one? I'm guessing it's not Shawshank. Uh yeah, it's uh it's Forrest Gump. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Other IMDb no, here. no, no. <laughs> <clears throat> My number one is a well, I'll preface by saying I'm not necessarily saying it's like the best movie of the 90s, but I think it's amazing and it's definitely like my favorite. So it's uh Satoshi Kon's Perfect Blue. Ooh. Oh nice. Uh, Hell yeah. This is a this is the movie I kind of credit for like getting me into like um art house like films and i guess art house like animation because i i was not familiar with like any um like auteur directors or whatever but i remember like coming across perfect blue on like the internet and um and watching the trailer i would just watch the trailer like over and over because something about it felt so different and so fucking eerie and atmospheric that like are literally things that are my favorite parts about watching my favorite movies today uh the film is like amazingly directed and edited it's uh it perfectly combines kind of like this nightmarish uh quality and like blending it with reality like you'd never know what exactly is real and what's in um the main character's head for those of you who don't know much about the movie, it's just about this um, Japanese pop idol who's retiring from her career. Um, and she has this like crazy obsessive stalker who uh, kind of is just unhinged, basically, and uh, following her around. And it's how the main character is just like paranoid about the whole ordeal. And uh, it just like, kind of distorts her reality basically 
Um, it kind of has like a pretty eerie parallel with um, a real life case. Like I won't get too much into it, but it involves like uh, Bjork. Uh, there, there's a there's a scene. Well, there's a real life incident with Bjork and her getting mailed like a fucking bomb, and that has like a parallel in this in this movie. It's pretty mm-hmm. fucked up. Yeah. Um, wow. Basic point saying is like this movie has like a lot of like real life. Uh, Stuff where, like, you know, how fans can get fucking this crazy parasocial relationship that can be dangerous if not like checked. Um, but also, yeah, I think this is like one of the best psychological uh horror movies out there, in my opinion. It's it's personally my favorite. Um, and yeah, I I gen I truly think Satoshi Khan is like a master director, he was a master director when he was around. Um because yeah, this this is one of the most important films to me in my like film history. I think it's amazing, and I hope uh, everybody else here can uh, at least appreciate it. Of course, I love Takoshi Khan. He's just from what I've seen. I haven't seen Tokyo Godfathers, but from the other three, a master, true master, and like taken way too soon. Like yeah, yeah just yep. yeah. I saw a Millennium Actress for the first time this year, and my God, what a masterpiece. Oh, that's a, such a great film. Yeah. I just, really, really want to see that movie. I haven't seen it yet. It is so... He articulates certain feelings that like I could never put into words, honestly. like That's the best way to describe that movie to me. Um, and like again, like our relationship to fame, like kind of like building off Perfect Blue in a way, uh, which is so interesting and so thought-provoking. And Perfect Blue is probably his uh magnum opus for sure so i have paranoia agent the, his uh uh television series i want to watch it really bad like after watching paprika the last time which was just like a week ago um i'm like i need to watch uh paranoia agent i've seen like 80 yeah. percent of it it's, it's really good like i i would recommend for just from what i've seen i would highly suggest that i mean nice yeah i haven't seen it but jen has seen it like back when she was like a teenager and she said that it's like such an amazing fucking show so i want to watch it one day me too seems amazing um you know uh i know interesting about perfect blue i think like darren aronofsky like bought the rights to that movie in order to make black swan which i always thought was very interesting because like Really similar imagery in both of those films. Um, yeah, actually, I, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I know he did buy the rights to the movie, but in uh, Requiem for a Dream, mm-hmm. uh, the one shot of uh, Jennifer Connelly in the bathtub was uh, lifted actually right from Perfect Blue. And I think yeah. he bought the rights for that scene. But, um, oh, really? Yeah, no, okay. no, I think that's how it went. Um, baby, Never mind. Okay. Like shot for shot. But um, yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. That yeah. It's like Perfect Blue has more in common with uh, Black Swan. I'm not. I'm not the kind of person who says like Black Swan is just a ripoff or anything. I'm just saying. They, no, I love that movie. Yeah, they share a lot of similarities. But Mike is uh, right. Like uh, that that scene in Requiem with a tub is directly lifted from Perfect Blue. Like, mm-hmm. damn, complete homage. Interesting. I haven't seen Requiem in a long time, so I guess if I rewatch it, like, oh shit, yeah, there it is. Um, because like the plot of Black Swan seems so much like he kind of he was inspired by Perfect Blue at least. So yeah, very influential movie and definitely it's deserves a spot on our top ten, which it will. Um, so Carlos, what's your what's your numero uno? All right. So my number one film is a film that we all love, and it's called Forrest Gump. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> thank goodness <laughs> i do love forrest gump though fyi i don't give a fuck i love that movie <laughs> to death it's an amazing film it makes me cry anyway um, that's fair that's fine <laughs> my my actual number one film is a martin scorsese picture and it is goodfellas um just couldn't pass up the opportunity it is one of my all-time favorite films and to me this is not only martin scorsese's best but it's also my favorite <laughs> Um, I mean, it's really hard to declare a Scorsese best, really, because there he just he he just made so many fucking masterful films. But um, Goodfellas is just the the perfect blend of stylistic filmmaking 
meets like accessible filmmaking. Um, Mark Scorsese has such a distinct style in this film, um, whether it's using like that like dark violent humor or utilizing like classic rock music as a sense of irony. Um, you know, all that is just like woven throughout the film. And it's a film that like, it's again, it's stylistic and it's creative as hell, but not like so like experimental to the point where like, you know, only certain people can love it. This is a film that you don't have to really love art film to love. It's a film that anybody could just watch and just absolutely love and adore. Um, and it's dripping with style. That's the amazing thing about it. I love films that are dripping with style that are very accessible. And Goodfellas is a film that I feel like embodies that perfectly. Um, brilliant characters, amazing story, uh, brilliant performances. Robert De Niro, the legendary Ray Liotta. Um, Rest in peace. Yeah, this is my God. He is insanely good in this film. Um, Joe Pesci the fucking uh you know what the fuck is so funny <laughs> fucking <laughs> scene funny how funny how <laughs> uh that scene is like uh, the, the amazing part about that apparently that a lot of that was improv from joe pesci yeah. and then it created one of the most iconic scenes in film history um so yeah uh i mean the film is just so great it has everything that you would love out of just like an entertaining film and um yeah i mean the fucking cocaine use is hilarious and also amazing <laughs> um and yeah i mean i could go on and on about this fucking movie but it is to, to me that my favorite uh like gangster mob film it is i, I actually prefer goodfellas over the godfather personally um which is kind of a hot take but like, I feel like I could just watch Goodfellas, like, any day, every day. The Godfather is maybe a little different. But, um, yeah, just an amazing film from start to finish. It's, to me, it's a masterpiece and by far one of the greatest films ever made. I'm I'm with you. I think it's, I think it's better than The Godfather, just in terms of rewatchability and artfulness, too. Because, like, you were, he sneaks a lot of, like... I always think of the scene with Robert De Niro smoking the cigarette to uh, cream. Oh yeah. Sunshine of your love. And it's like an amazing like art piece within this like gangster movie. And like, yeah, he loves to sneak like kind of like, yeah, like the one take sequence into the cabana, like just very artful things that are just blend seamlessly with that movie. And I agree. I think it's like everything Scorsese was culminated in his career, just like different stylistic tones and subject matters. He was kind of like interested in kind of blend. That's kind of like, the magnum opus of everything he's been working towards at the time um and yeah it's a movie that me means a lot to me like my we watch it like every year on my brother's birthday and like make a bunch of pasta and sit down and enjoy the <laughs> hell out of it and i just it's just such a that's amazing it's like the most rewatchable movie in my in my life next to like the pick lebowski so um it's an obvious pick for sure but i think it's like really it needs to be here so i think if yeah. you weren't gonna pick it i think mike or someone else we were all saying we're we would yeah, pick I it at one point i believe happens. it's just it's just a perfect film what, what more could i say yep i'm uh, glad we all agree do we <laughs> i think so <laughs> i mean i mean i think i, I think blair like personally prefers casino over goodfellas but uh maybe I that's, have a to good, that's a good that's a cool take though i think uh, it's a no, good take i love goodfellas it's just it's not my top three scorsese that's that's it that's really. fine there's there's so many good movies you know it's not yeah. it's really hard to pick casino yeah. i think is also an incredible movie i do so. love casino though it's that's great it's, yeah yeah I want to talk more about Goodfellas, but I need we need to wrap up our list. I, I so, know. Yeah. <laughs> like Fair enough. There's so much I can say. Um, I, I love it. It's gonna be, it's gonna be high on the list for sure. That's for sure. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy, two times. I was just about to say that. <laughs> we have to at least squeeze in Jimmy two times for a second, right? I need to go get the papers. Get the papers. There you go. More like it needs to be two times on this list. Yeah, it gets two. Sp <laughs> uh, okay. Um. I can't follow that up with a better film with, with it's hard to follow that film up, but I'll try. Yeah. Um, my number one, again, uh, 
pretty obvious pick, but it's it's I I tr- I believe it's the best film of the '90s personally. Uh, it's Fargo by Joel and Ethan. Oh Cohen. yes, nice. Um, Let's go. Build, building off of what Carlos was saying about the Big Lebowski, um, I just the Cohen brothers are just I think just geniuses on every level. Definitely, you know, some of the best screenwriter directors we have. Um, and for a while, like you know. Fargo is the movie that I feel like one of the, at least one of the Coen brothers movies that gets us all really into the Coen brothers. Cause it's an essential film. Um, and like I said earlier, I took a class on the Coen brothers and there's so many movies I just kind of got lost in and like, kind of like this might be my favorite and that might be my favorite and that one. And it is Lebowski is my favorite, but I think Fargo is the <laughs> most layered and completely just perfected movie that they've ever made. Um, I, yeah. I think the script is like it's hysterically realized and like obviously the language and the of the each character is so well realized and obviously translated to the performances. Like I said, Francis McDormand in this film is like sometimes like one of my favorite performances on film. I think she's just so great, but also William H. Macy as the uh, the kidnapper, yeah, they, the, yeah, the the yeah. schemer behind the kidnapping. And the freaking car salesman. <laughs> yeah. I'm corroborated here. <laughs> Just so good. My but God. What the heck like, you mean? <laughs> what the heck do you mean? <laughs> God, like. He just reminds me. I grew up in the Midwest, and like so many of these characters, just remind me of like these kind of like well mannered, um, kind of just afraid of confrontation individuals that I just relate to them so well. I don't know what it is, um, and there's just like there's many aspects of this movie that just really hit close to home for me while being just an amazing crime epic. Um, Steve Buscemi and Peter Starmari are just so funny together. Like he's so good in the movie. So they're sitting in the car, and he's like. It's like, why don't you say something every once in a while? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, how about the silent treatment now? You, you're going to like it too, buddy. And he just keeps talking and he's like defeated. <laughs> it's just brilliant writing on every level. Um, it's similar to Goodfellas. I can go on, but I just like, and like this movie has like a very comforting Midwest feel to it. I, I And like, I live in California now. So I kind of watch this movie whenever I kind of crave that sort of home, home, home feeling of like, comfort and like kind of well-mannered people um i just love it it just it speaks to a lot of my sensibilities when it comes to film and and really intriguing as hell like mystery and and like it just it just says everything in my opinion for like a tight 90 minute movie so uh yeah that has that just has to be number my number one it gets better like with lebowski it gets better every time i watch it so you betcha (laughs) betcha you betcha I agree. Uh, I, I I adore Fargo a lot. So good. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah, if anyone has anything else to say, we could start with the uh, making the list, man. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's just uh, let's do this. Um, so obviously our number one films of making the list. Uh, we got Shawshank Redemption, we got Perfect Blue, we got Fargo, and we got Goodfellas. Um, so those are automatically in. So I'll, I'll do what we did last time. I'll just go through everyone's list and like yay or nay. That'll be the easiest way, right? Um yeah, and if we got honorable mentions, I feel like we can shout them out what before we after we do this. Um I definitely have a lot, but for time's sake, I'll try to dwindle it down because <clears throat> goddamn it might take a while, but uh, for Mike's list, uh, number five, Beau Traval. Um I haven't seen it. Me that's either. a tough. That's a tough one for me, man. I love that movie, but I might have to say nay because uh, there's so many other movies on Mike's list I want to say yes to. So I'm sorry, Mike. <laughs> nah, not, not <laughs> I know, I know, not like a lot of us have seen it, but um, oh yeah, I I love the movie too, though. So it's I it's hard to say no. But Taste of oh, Cherry, well. I said yes. I say my, yes. That's on my list too, so I obviously have to see it. Was, yes. It was originally on my list. It was one of my list as number two as well. Oh shit. Okay, yeah. So that's that's in there. Yeah. Uh Buffalo 66. I want to say yes so bad. Me too. I want I want to say yes, but I just I think realistically it won't make it. That's yeah. I that's, think something else might take it. I'll put an asterisk, but that's fair, Carlos. Um 
Train spotting? Nay. I would say yay. <laughs> Damn. I, I, I'll tough, say right? yay. I'll say yeah for now, but it's just so many great films. So I don't know. I know. I'll put an asterisk on that one too, because we gotta I don't want to run into the last time where we ran out of movies when we got to like the last person. So yeah. But those are heavy consideration, I in my yeah. opinion. All right, we'll go to Blair's next. <clears throat> Three colors red. I would say yay, but I know a lot of you, you guys said you hadn't seen it yet. So yeah, I haven't seen it. That's yeah. kind of tough. Fuck, I love that movie, but <laughs> uh Oh, I'll pass. I'm sorry, Blair. That's fine. I love that movie, though. Oh, I, I forgot to say Crash. I'm sorry. Cronenberg. I mean, I, I know that's not going to make it. So <laughs> I already, I'm not going to fight for that. That's fine. You know I would defend you, though. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, funny Games. Uh, uh. I do. <laughs> um, personally, I, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't I, either. I, I love it, but probably no. Just up against everything else. I don't know. I know. Damn. Damn. <laughs> Boogie Nights, hell yeah. Yeah. I, I would say yeah. I'll say yes. You, you said yes, Mike? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Carlos's list is going to be hard because like, I, I would say yes to all of these, but uh, eyes wide shut. Yes. 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 <laughs> Mike? Yeah, I'll say yeah. Oh, my God, we're going to run out of movies. Big Lebowski, yes. I'd say yes, obviously, but <laughs> I'll say no. Oh, <laughs> I'm counting the movies real quick. Hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven in right now. God damn. Uh, you said no to Lebowski. Put an asterisk. I think it's fair. all right. I'll put an asterisk. Toy okay. Story 2. Yes. Um. I would, I, I would say no. Personally. Oh no, Mike, no. you're shitting on our childhood. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'll yeah, asterisk no, that one too. Yeah. I'll asterisk that one. A uh, festin or the celebration? Yes. Oh, come on. Yes. Absolutely. Mike. I, oh, you haven't seen it. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you haven't yeah, seen it. Haven't. Okay, I'll, I'll start. I'll start for now. Um. Secrets and lies. That's my list. I would say yes. Yes. Yeah. I haven't seen it. Shit. <laughs> I'm going to start though for now. <laughs> twin, <laughs> twin, twin Peaks already knows a no because half of you haven't seen it, right? So Yeah, I haven't seen it. That's okay. I, heat, I know. So, you know. Probably not. That's yeah, okay. I love it. Ah, fucking hell. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> All right. That's that's all of them for now. Fargo makes it. Um, let me count real quick. We got Shawshank. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so we got one room for one more to uh, fit in that we haven't mentioned yet. Huh. That got asterisks at least. Okay, what um, are the, all the ones with asterisks? Um, wait, shit, did I not count Boogie Nights? Hold on. <laughs> so hold on, sorry. <laughs> Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, we're at nine. Okay, the Asterix films are Train Spotting, Buffalo 66, um, <laughs> Big Lebowski, Toy Story 2, and Funny Games. God damn. Oh my tough. god, that's awful. Um <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, can I name the movies that we have in there? We could like, I don't know if you guys want to switch one out or something. Yeah. So we got okay. Shawshank, Taste of Cherry, Perfect Blue, Boogie Nights, Goodfellas, The Celebration, Eyes Wide Shut, Fargo, Secrets and Lies. Yeah, I wouldn't switch any of those out. Yeah, I wouldn't either. <laughs> um, this is tough. I'll let you guys, I mean, you know, deliberate. Personally... Personally, I mean, I'm not going to go the Toy Story 2 train, but I think that the Big Lebowski. You know what? Big Big Lebowski was the one I was like most inclined to say yeah to, like to move on to the list. I mean, same. It's one of my favorite movies, but I feel like Mike's getting shafted right now because he has two train spotted and Buffalo 66. Uh, Between the two, I'd probably go train spotting, honestly. Well, I am cool with train spotting, honestly. 
I mean, I would rather, I mean, obviously I'm biased. I'm <sighs> like, I would like the big Lebowski to make it, but I find being fair. I think train spotting makes a lot of sense too. Yeah. And look, the Coen brothers are my favorites. So I'd, I, I would love to have for them to have two movies, but should we give shine to train spotting or Buffalo 66? I, think, I love Buffalo 66 more than both of them, but I train think I spotting like, is okay. That's really hard. I think I like Buffalo 66 more than train spotting, but I'm trying to like be, a, I guess, objective, like culturally speaking. <laughs> no, I know. I agree with you. I, <laughs> I do, but in terms of diversifying the list of filmmakers, you know, and it's my fault because I put Fargo at number one, but uh, you're good. I don't know what to do here. I'm at a crossroads. But I did look, I'm I'm not against two Coen brothers being in the list. I'm just saying I'm that. not either. I'm not either. <laughs> not I either. just love Buffalo and Train Spot in a lot. And I f I don't I it's hard for me to throw them under the bus that quickly. For me, really in reality, it's between Big Lebowski or Train Spotting. That's the way okay. I view it. All right, that's fair. Cause because what 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 are the other ones? I'm sorry. What are the other ones in Asterix? Buffalo 66, um, Funny Games, Toy Story 2, Lebowski. Well, I know Toy Story 2 ain't going to make it. But... <laughs> I would put it in personally, but... I but... think I would too, but since Funny Games getting fucked, then fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> what about... Uh... Hear, hear me out. What about Jurassic Park? <laughs> oh, yeah, we didn't do our honorable mentions yet. Hold on, hold on. Uh. I would put Jurassic, Jurassic Park's one of my all-time favorite movies, but same. I feel like other people are like. I mean, I love Jurassic Park, but I mean, fuck, I'd rather have Big Lebowski in there. <laughs> <laughs> Blair's like fuck, fucking fuck Schmaltzberg. <laughs> yeah. I have a, a few honorable mentions. I don't think they'll make it, but I have Chunking Express, Lahine. Oh, dude, Lahine would be a good one. Yeah, what the fuck? Uh, <laughs> no one brought uh, it up. Uh, I really like I really like Laheim, but I'm not like I guess as huge on it as everybody else. What about South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut? <laughs> Ooh, I do love that movie. That's I do love that movie. Yeah. Movie. Um, the honorable mentions. So I probably yeah. Uh, what are your guys's? Um, of all the honorable mentions, I have I, I'd say welcome to to the dollhouse. Love, oh, yeah. that, love movie. that movie. I would put hap happiness too as a honorable. I was option. thinking of like picking between happiness and welcome to the to the dollhouse, and I just feel like welcome to the dollhouse is just I don't. It just feels like a more universal movie. Just um. Yeah. I don't know. It, it's, it's just gr it's great just movie. Amazing. Yeah. Blair Carlos, do you guys have any honorables? There's three honorable mentions I really want to mention. So, uh, audition by Takashi Miike. Love uh, it. Gummo by Harmony Korine, and um. <laughs> Uh, end of Evangelion, but that's not gonna make it, of course. I just yeah. want to mention that one. No, that's fair. Yeah, I love I love Gummo and and uh, what was the first one you said? Audition, audition. Yeah, yeah, love that one. What about a uh, Cure? Cure's. I love Cure. Like Kurosawa. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. Um, Princess Mononoke. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I do love Princess. Mononoke I would put too. Toy Story two though over that. If we're I, nah, not me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, no. Yeah. I, I, no, I, I mean that's that that's fair. It's probably a better movie, but I, I, Toy Story two is is too special to me. Yeah, same. Uh, Crumb, the documentary. Oh yeah, Crumb. Whoa, 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 whoa! Hold up. Close hold up. up. Hold up. What hmm. about Pulp, Pulp Fiction? <laughs> oh <No>. yeah. <laughs> Jake was Jake we was said not we going to bring this. that up. <laughs> no, nah, dude. Kidding. Somebody's gonna be like, "How did have they not mentioned Pulp Fiction?" Right, you mentioned the it. First two hours. Of you the mentioned movie. it. We can move on, though. We can move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about like, like Reservoir Dogs? Even like, no. I, I love Reservoir. I love, I love Reservoir Dogs and Jackie Brown a lot, actually. But I, I personally wouldn't put them on the list. Damn, Honorable bro. mention, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, bro, we're, we're about to have a top 10 90s without Pulp Fiction. Well, That's crazy. I wanted it. Yeah, I was hoping no one was going to bring up the honorable mention, but you have to bring it up. Yeah, uh, true. I guess so. <laughs> then I'll bring up the Matrix. Fuck it. I was going to bring up the oh, Matrix. Oh, dude, I love the Matrix. What the fuck? I love oh, the yeah. Matrix, but I put Jurassic really Park above all that. 
No, bro. <laughs> Jurassic Park is one of my favorite movies ever, but I know, yeah. I know just, these guys are okay. So we have put we Gummo should... in there and call it a day. <laughs> call yeah. it a... I'm Gummo down number. for that. I'm let's down. Just do Gummo number one and say <laughs> fuck it. <laughs> Gummo two. I'm down to just say fuck everything and put Gummo. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, I'm not even joking. I'm serious. Yeah, I'm not joking either. <laughs> That's up to you guys. The ball is for court. real. Seriously, yeah, I'm dead, I'm I'm dead ass. ass. Mike, Mike, would you no, do that? I, I would not never put gummo. In number one. <laughs> oh, not a number one. I love it. But in like, the top I, I, no, 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 one. no, not number one. Just, just in oh. the list, in top ten. Just the last, oh, the last slot the we have. Ten? Yeah, kinda, no, I wouldn't be opposed to it in like the top ten, but like number one, I was like, God, no, no, not no. That one, was a no. joke. That was a joke. Okay. <laughs> I just like betrays all of the movies we talked about, though. <laughs> it's like fucking Gummo's ahead of all those. I love Gummo though. <laughs> a movie that we didn't even put in any of our lists is number yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious though. Fuck yeah, it. I'm serious too. We can put that in number ten. I put that above Big, Big Lebowski. I mean, I mean, I don't believe it's better from the Big Lebowski. So you're gonna but... sacrifice Big Lebowski. Buffalo train spotted and Toy Story 2. Oh my god. Well, you say it like that. No, <laughs> I mean, you, know, you have to because, like, I love Gummo, but is it better than those? No, in it's some not. ways, it is. It's no universe. <laughs> in some, it's in not. like, that's true. It's its own lane. It's a great movie, but like, I don't know. I, I, I personally wouldn't have it in my like top 10. Uh, I, I mean, I sounded, it sounded cool, but now when you listen to all the other films, I don't uh, know. I, I stand exactly. on my convictions. No, I love it. I was going to say La, over La Hain that we were going to bring up. Like, that was the one that automatically gets through his gummo. Kind of crazy, but I love gummo. I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for like La, uh, La Hain making the list. Honestly, I was, I kind of screwed up my list. Um, it was originally going to be, I don't even know what happened, but uh, no, La Hain definitely deserves a spot if you ask me. Yeah, I second that too. I would but... too. Yeah, I think Carlos is the only one that's a little yeah, objective. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put that movie above Toy Story Two or The Big Lebowski <laughs> or even Train Spotting, really, or even even Buffalo Sixty Six. I like that movie more than Lahaine. <laughs> Lahaine, yeah, I guess I haven't seen Lahaine in a while, but I remember it was, it was pretty masterful. When I, I think it's a great movie. Trust me, I think it's great. I just don't think it's as good as the others. I would say fucking to put Toy Story Two, but I don't. That's yes. <laughs> What's up with y'all? Why y'all are so against Toy Story 2? I mean, I'm... Well, I I don't know. I'm kind of split on it. What do we not split on? That has to be the movie that we're not split on. Like Big Lebowski. Buffalo. Yeah, this Big Lebowski is it, I feel like. We, is that what we're doing? I'll do it. It's I love it to death. I'll do it. Look, I'm cool with Big Lebowski or Train Spotting. Y'all have to pick between those two. Well, I... I I like train spotting, but I'm not, you know. Were, were we all like unanimous on Eyes Wide Shut? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Right? Okay. I'm just making sure because I remember I started that quickly. O- originally, I was like, that's got to be on my list because, yeah, I love yeah, I Eyes agree. Wide Shut. Okay. So I guess it's Lebowski, unless anyone has any objections. I just feel bad for Mike. He got shafted. That's all good. <laughs> I'm, team, I just team player. Yeah. The other two movies I, I genuinely love, but do I love them more than Lebowski? I don't know. I don't know. All right. It's time to rank these now, I guess. Um, you want me to okay. read the movies? Sure. That we that we start? Uh, Shawshank, Taste of Cherry, Perfect Blue, Boogie Nights, Goodfellas, The Celebration, Big Lebowski, Eyes Wide Shut, Fargo, and Secrets and Lies. So what's okay. last on this list? I think... Big Lebowski should be number ten. Fair, right? Or am I wrong? Yeah, no, that's I'm, I'm just that's fair. Down. I would say Big Lebowski or um, Boogie Nights, maybe, but I would say Big Lebowski, I guess. I'm fine with Boogie Nights being nine. So we I'm got Big. Le- fine with that too. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say Big Lebowski at ten mm-hmm. and then nine Boogie Nights. Is that is that what is is that oh, good? Oh yeah, that's I think. Great. I think Lebowski should be a little higher. You think so? Yeah, just a little bit. I mean, okay. I, I'm. I mean, I, I'm in favor of that. <laughs> then what's number ten? That's what I'm trying to decide. Ten, um, just so I can move. Either Boogie Nights or what else did you say? Uh, Shawshank, uh, <laughs> Goodfellas, The Celebration, Eyes Wide Shut, Fargo, Secrets and Lies, Boogie Nights, Perfect Blue. 
I mean, say celebration at number ten, but again, I haven't seen it, so I can't really comment. Oh, that's right. Personally, I think eyes wide like, shut. Maybe. I think I think the bottom three should be like Perfect Blue, The Big Lebowski, and maybe Boogie Nights. But okay, I'm fine with that. I would okay. I would almost say eyes wide shut, even though I love it. But I mean, two of those that I just listed were Blair, so I feel kind of bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's what's or what's last Boogie Nights. We can do we can do the Big Lebowski last if you'd like, and then we'll do oh, okay. Two of other Blairs in front of in front of mine. Okay, I can live with that. <laughs> Perfect blue at nine or eight. Eight. Please. Is it better than boogie? But it's better than boogie nights, right? I I, I personally don't think perfect. Blue yeah, I, I I would put boogie nights above perfect blue. No disrespect. It's a great movie, but I don't think it's nearly as good as boogie nights. Shit, I'm sorry, Blair. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> You're in the, these both made the top ten though. That's great. Yeah. Um. Number seven, Eyes Wide Shut, or am I am I dissing it too much? I think it's, I don't think, I think it's top five. I think five that's material. fair. I, think, I don't yeah, think it's top fair. five. I don't that's think fine. it's top five material. That's why it's hard. Yeah, I think that's fair. <clears throat> okay. Um, number six, Shawshank. Yeah. Yeah. I, honestly, I think that should be below Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> Me too, but. No. Yeah. What oh, do you think, man, Jake? That's... No, that's a good point. I didn't even think about that. Ah, oh, Mike, do you have any retaliation against that slander? <laughs> no, Not I'm slander gonna, to me, but against I your movie. I mean, think. I mean, the Shawshank should be like above Eyes Wide Shot, but um, <sighs> you know, wait, it's like it's whatever. I'm kind of on your side, even though I like Eyes Wide Shut more. I think Shawshank is more of a '90s like essential trademark. Yeah, that's true, though. Well, for going with is, that, if we're going is, with, I'm sorry, go ahead. I said Kubrick has gotten <laughs> so many spots in the top five. Does he need another one? Like he was in every decade, he got a spot. So, damn, <laughs> that's not a diss I mean, against Kubrick. I'm just saying. Well, if we want, we can do we can do eyes wide. We can put Sean Shake above uh, Kubrick. It's just one spot, you know. Yeah, it's I just, fine. I, I can, yeah, I can live yeah. with it. But if we're going like with essential '90s trademark, then where the fuck's Pulp Fiction? I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. We're gonna get flamed for that. I'm sorry. I don't to be care. I don't pessimistic, care. Pessimistic, but I hope you guys know what's coming. I don't. I don't. Honestly, don't care about if we get flamed. Base. They that's can true. fucking deal with that. Whatever. If they think that's if they think that's not accurate, they can. They're gonna comment. I know it. But that's true. Fuck them all. Um, <laughs> they think that's not accurate. They can suck on my dick. <laughs> <laughs> they can suck on my dick. Uh, all right, top five. We got we got uh, Goodfellas, The Celebration, Fargo, Secrets and Lies. His a cherry. Sorry, is the other one. I think if you if you want to get the number one out of the way, personally, I think it should be Goodfellas. But I think it's The Celebration. I mean, I'm cool with that one? too. As number one. Yeah. yeah, I'm cool with the celebration or Goodfellas being number one. I'm, I'm so... fine with Goodfellas being number two, but so Carlos is top two movies. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> when you put it that no, I'm just... the misfit <laughs> pond uh, bias here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> celebrate! I can't confidently say the celebration is better than Goodfellas, but me neither. And I love the celebration. I just saw yeah. it for the first time like a few days ago, but so it's really would, hard. Uh, but I didn't taste the cherry at like number five. If I'm being honest, really, Piece of cherry. Yeah, it was in your top five, though, Mike. It was, but um, I don't. I feel like there is more importance in like I don't know. Like yeah, important. that's fine. All right, I'll put it in number five. It was my number two. I, I'm just saying because it was Blair's. It was my number two top. as well. Yeah, so it's like that seems a little low, but oh yeah, I forgot about that. Oh shit. I think number five would be Secrets and Lies. I haven't mm. seen it, so that kind of makes sense. What do you think it's a little higher? I think Secrets and Lies is better than Taste of Cherry. Arguably, yeah. But Arguably. That's just my that's just my opinion. Opinion man. Fucking, that's just my opinion, man. <laughs> <laughs> um okay, I mean I'm fine with that. So Taste okay. of Cherry number five, and then Secrets and Lies number four. Yeah. Okay. 
We got secrets and lies. We got three spots left. Goodfellas, the celebration, and Fargo. I forgot about mentioning Fargo. Fargo number three. Okay. Yeah. And then celebration two and Goodfellas one. I mean, I that's what I would say, but I don't know what y'all think. Um, for, what about Mike? Yeah. I go uh, number two, Goodfellas one, and um, I mean celebration number three again. I haven't seen it. But, you three. put Fargo. Where would you put Fargo? Number two. Honestly, I'm cool with that. I'm personally cool with that too. Uh, two crime. <laughs> who's who? Who's as Blair? Like, oh. I mean, I w- I wasn't even stoked with the idea of Secrets and Lies being number four because I haven't seen it, but uh, I don't know. Well, once is you it? see it, you'll you'll understand. Uh, dude, Taste of Cherry is so high in my in like my esteem. I don't know about it's number that. five though. It's right after it. Uh, well, we can. How about this? If 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 we swap those, will will you be cool with the top three that we just said? Yeah. I don't mind swapping those. I love both of them. Okay, swap swap Taste of Cherry and Secrets and Lies then, and then we'll go with the. Uh, God, I should have ri- used a pencil in this episode. <laughs> um, so then well, Fargo is number two, and Goodfellas one. Then is that the thing? Yeah, and then the celebration number three. Okay. I like that. As long as Taste of Cherry is above Secrets and Lies, Blair is happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds nice to me. <laughs> that's, that's a lovely... Uh... Because, because honestly, like, I could I could be fine with, like, Taste of Cherry being, like, number one. Like, as my number one. I don't, you know. Yeah. I, I was going to say that, but then I immediately, like, no, number five. So I was like, I, I legit think it could be my number one, too, but that's okay. I went I with Celebration initially because I knew there was a good chance everybody would be on board. I think it made the top three. I think that's really good. Yeah, yeah. So. I'm not. Uh, I'm not complaining. Okay. Um, let I us. Just, I just Sorry. can't wait for all the comments saying, "Why the fuck? No is more Paul- fiction." <laughs> I know it's yeah. what a bunch of fucking hacks. And okay. Wait, do, do you really? You really think it should be on there? Like, as outside. Whatever. The... No, nah, it's it's a good list. Whatever. This is our personal list. Yeah. Right? We're not. We're yeah, not. Yeah. We're not doing like IMDb's objective best here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we took a lot of <laughs> shots at them today. <laughs> um, okay, I'll read the top 10 then. Uh, number 10 is The Big Lebowski. Number 9 is Perfect Blue. Number 8 is Boogie Nights. Number 7 is Eyes Wide Shut. Number 6, Shaw- Shawshank Redemption. Number 5, Secrets and Lies. Number 4, Taste of Cherry. Number 3, The Celebration. 2 is Fargo. And 1 is Goodfellas by Martin Scorsese. Yeah, that's that's based as fuck. Yeah. That's a great. That's a really great good list. list. Yeah, it's it's. I have no issues with this, unlike other ones. Like this is. Yeah. Yeah. I, no. I, no woman under the influence. No, none of that debacle. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly thought Pulp Fiction was going to cause a stir today if someone brought it up. I'd I'd be so resistant to put it on, but it's good. It's I mean, good. I mean, I really love the movie, but I'm not. I'm not super passionate about it to be arguing for it. So. But I do I, think it's fantastic. It's a great movie. I just I don't think it's like top ten in the nineties, though. I'll be honest. I think it's like must see masterpiece material. But um, I don't know. Like I said, there's more Blair core in the nineties that I have to vouch for. So me too. Uh, same way. I feel the same way. Uh, Mike, do you want to take a shot at Pulp Fiction? <laughs> I'm not. I'm all good. <laughs> <laughs> the internet will hate you too much. Nothing with the ten foot pole. What? I don't want to touch it with a ten foot pole. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, that's our '90s episode. Um, really great list, if you ask me. So, definitely let us know where we went wrong. We already know. We already know what you're gonna say. So <laughs> don't, don't even bother. Um, you know, we didn't mention Close Up by Kiristami either. So that might be another one that might get people riled oh, yeah. up. Yeah, I love that film a lot. It's, it's a great movie. Yeah, but Taste of Cherry, but for me, is the is the Actually, one that. I, I actually like close up more than Taste of Cherry on the record. Okay. I I, uh, I was really close to putting Life and Nothing More on my list, but Ooh, yeah. it got eked out by uh, Three Colors Red. Yeah, that's another great one. And, you know, if, if you get mad at Pulp Fiction, honestly, Jurassic Park is the real uh, victim here and Toy Story 2, <laughs> if you ask me, but uh, that's all right. The childhood movies don't make it on as much. So, um, but yeah. That's it. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Um, we're going to be doing the 2000s next uh, with Kaylin. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Can't wait. Oh, to, yes. That's, that's going to be even harder to make for me, like, honestly, because I 
like Mike said, it's like the most movies I've seen. That's probably a stacked from... year, yeah. That's yes. a, that's a very stacked one. So, um, I mean, Mike, thank you for thank coming. You. Um, you're a lovely, you. you're a lovely human being. So it was great to have you on. Um, and is there anything you want to plug, uh, in terms of your socials, anything like that? Not particularly. No, I don't really, um, not very heavy on uh, social media or YouTube, but, um, thanks so much for having me on. It was a blast, uh, both episodes. Um, yeah, yeah. Hopefully I'll, you guys will have me back for me someday. I mean, I'm more than welcome, but, um, thank you. Thank you again. Of course. We'll definitely have you back and Blair, anything you want to plug? Spooky uh, Blair. Yeah, just my uh, Instagram. It's like the only thing I use. It's uh, mm-hmm. spooky underscore Blair. Hell yeah. It was, you had great uh, picks this episode, I think. Oh, so thank we, you. We overlapped a lot. Um, yeah. And of course, Carlos, um, Misfit Pond, you know, you know the drill. Go in the Discord, please. Five dollars a month on Patreon. <laughs> uh, yeah, seriously, it's a it's a it's a blast, man. We want I, I swear to god, at this point we have like four movie nights a week. Um, we have like two discussions on average every week of of uh, certain movies, blind recommendations, and uh it's just it's a really great place to go if um if you're um want to be included in a bunch of with a bunch of uh, Kino Lord friends who just all love the art of filmmaking. Um, but yeah, and um, you can follow me on Letterboxd with the same name, The Misfit Pond. I'm on there, on Instagram, same thing. And obviously subscribe to my channel on YouTube and that's it. Do it. Yeah, Go, join them. You should just join the Discord just so you can yell us at us about Pulp Fiction, you know? That, that's a good <laughs> sense. Don't join worry, us. Perry got you covered, though. He's going to get on those, too. <laughs> I'm sure he will. That's fine. Um, obviously, subscribe to the Cinnabumps channel on YouTube, uh, Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff. Follow our Instagram. We've, we're doing shorts now, which which are a lot of fun. Um, uh, we'll be doing more from these decades series. So, yeah, look out for that. Look out for the 2000s episode. And thank you guys again. This was a, a wonderful episode, as always. So have a good day. Thank you. Have a good one.